um, learn this, add it to our practice, and then grow from there. Um, I want to appreciate really medical consulting, and then um, hospitals can always reach out to you. And leave me also to the social media. We have three hospitals: Cardio Care, Living Children's Hospital, and Living Hospital. And as we expand our network and focus a lot on advocacy training, you notice that Living Hospital has been pumping this training, that training, and all of that. It's our passion for the Nigerian healthcare system. We believe that you cannot have a Ferrari in the village. That's the summary. If the roads are not good, your Ferrari is going to die. If other people don't have Ferraris, you're not going to get spare parts. So you cannot have a Ferrari in the village. So I don't want to use somebody's state. Let me use my wife's state. I say you cannot have a Ferrari in an umbra. Why? You are the only one that will have it. No spare parts, no mechanics, no roads. So if all of us have Ferraris, then all of us can now grow together. So one of my friends, Dr. Okogu, he runs a very big hospital group in, in Delta Warri Axis. He has three or four. Always says that there's a level to which a hospital can grow if other hospitals are not growing around, that you cannot just cross it. So that's some of our passion that we, we contribute what we know. We get great facilitators like Barista Owa to come in. We are learning, we exchange knowledge. You have some knowledge that we exchange, and then Nigerian healthcare system grows for the better. So sit back, um, relax, learn, and, as, and uh, you know, transform Nigerian healthcare. I would want to ask us to take a brief word of prayer. Um, let's just stand up for one minute. We'll just take a brief word of prayer as we start. Uh, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather. Um, as we learn, as we discuss, as we engage, we ask that we um, benefit the most from this and that everyone um, our patients above all shall get the best, and we also shall, you know, shall improve our practices. And you take all the glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, and uh, I wish us all good celebrations. Dr. Officer is here, from, medical director from Cardio Care um, Specialty Hospital, the Guru Eternal Medicine. So if it's not medical, if it's not legal, you can meet him. Dr. Peter, medical director. Living Children's Hospital is a pediatric cardiologist and a guru in pediatrics as well. So it's not medical and the best for children meet him. Okay, I, I just work there. Doctor Mrs. Seko, <laughs> the CEO of the hospital group. Welcome back, the chairman. Thank you so much for joining us. And the beautiful team behind, great guys and ladies, Pamela, Stanley, Veronica, Sonto, everybody. Here. If I didn't call your name, it's here. God bless you. All right, so let's have a nice one. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Iseko. Let me start again by appreciating um, the hospital. We are trailblazing and showing the, the pathway of outgoing healthcare delivery in Nigeria. I also want to appreciate, I have with me in Radimed my team, Kenny and Dami and Lim Brian, uh, Phoebe and Onyinye. Uh, it's actually not easy to, and I want to acknowledge the online um, uh, virtual participants. Uh, for your sakes, I've been told to remain as much as possible in one spot. And uh, at least the ones that we can get maximally. It's not actually easy to facilitate anything with doctors. I mean, it, it's, um, I think, right from medical school, the university I, I, I attended, doctors were actually classed special. They were given special hostels. They were given special rooms. They were just the envy of campus. And so they, they, they just have a kind of a special place. So when I, when I started doing, um, working with doctors, I still had this little fear. So um, this is just, just some little fear about doctors. But I found one thing about doctors that actually made me feel human. I found out that as brainy as they are, they have bad writers. As a matter of fact, sometimes I actually, um, I actually thought there is a course on bad writing in medical school. 
I mean, you know how you go through a course on bad writing. I, I, I read through a particular funny um, manual and um, the, the, some, someone just had a brainwave and decided to ask why, why, why are doctors writing? Why is it bad? And he went to town asking um, doctors, can you basically just tell us why you're writing is bad? And some very funny answers, you know, one actually said, well, if my writing is legible and clear, the pharmacies will actually think I'm dumb. Um, I, I, another Canadian doctor actually said, well, um, it's good that my writing is bad because if my record is subpoenaed in a court for medical negligence or malpractice, well, I would just tell them that's exactly what I wrote. Since, I mean, I'll just tell them that's another one said, well, in primary school, my teacher actually told me that. Your writing is so bad that the only profession that is fit for you is the medical profession. <laughs> so I grew up to be a doctor. I I I want to I want to I want to say this this um so I because of this I, I will not teach a doctor. We're basically going to learn, uh we're just basically going to learn together. Uh we are going to engage on um this, this training on medical on medical ethics uh, sorry i need to someone needs to put me through on how to navigate around this slide okay okay that's fine so we've we've just basically gone through um the introductions will get um, to know ourselves better. Let's look at basically the training, this particular session's training objectives. One is to stay up in the practitioner, the quest to get familiar with the code of medical ethics, so as to avoid medical legal pitfalls and ethical violations. Um, I'm hoping that we're going to take a look at the, the approach to this training will be to practically look at the, the um, to look at medical legal cases. Um, I try as much as possible not to use foreign ones. They are real names, names that some of some medical practitioners will really know. Once um, a litigation gets into the law courts, there is no longer veiling of identity. It becomes a matter of public consumption. For example, um, when politicians go to court, um, there's nothing like, oh, why are you putting my name out there? Well, you went to court, so your name will be out, out there. So these cases um, are going to be re they are real names and real issues of people is not theoretical and as a matter of fact, when i read some of those cases i need to go check what certain funny terms that that peculiar to doctors what what they actually mean mean to uphold the high standards of medical practice in view of the high value of health and life and, and, and like dr Seko had said um I, I i didn't get in fct i i I've, I've not gotten the data and statistics of medical um, cases, but I know that they are they are growing at an alarming rate. You know, the, the highest um, number of cases we have in the FCT is um, matrimonial causes. You will know it because we have a peculiar um, number with which you identify them. Then you have political cases, of course, because we are in. Um, um, the dispensation of politics. But it is amazing as to how um, conflict is um, developing between hospitals and um, and their patients. The sad part of it, and why we I'm going to be even more committed to this kind of training, is the unorthodox um, way of 
venting of assessing justice. Sometimes um, people go to security agents and they come in into situations that they have no business at all being in. It's really, it can really, really be a matter of concern. And so we really need to um, take some of the things we are going to be looking at more seriously as we engage in the materials together. Um, so we are also going to be looking at um, three issues, ethical knowledge, which is mandatory uh, by the Code of Medical Ethics, um, improved service delivery, and the practitioner's ethical protection. The, 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 the medical practitioner is too important to us, especially at this time when there's a, an unprecedented mass exodus of the medical um, practitioner. So ethical knowledge, which is mandatory, in improved service, service delivery, because we're dealing with lives of people uh, and their aspirations. Practitioners' ethical protection. Um, medical ethics, basically, the legal code of conduct that guide and regulates practice of medicine and dentistry in, in Nigeria. Value proposition, to protect the healthcare institution and the practitioner in the event of medical litigation, which is on the increase, to help the practitioner recognize how to navigate around ethical crisis situation. Somebody is going to do a particular presentation as on, on this, and then I will come in a little bit to narrow down, but a number of the things we'll be looking at will focus on how do I identify a, a pitfall. When you're driving your car, you actually have different sensors that tells you that, look, your, your foil is down, your, the red signal, the warning signs, how do you, how do you, how do you recognize these? And the best way I think we can do is, is the approach to this, um, um, to this, training, which is going to be look at practical case studies, discuss them together, and, and come up with. In, in that engagement, I believe that the medical um, practitioner is going to learn one or two things. So to help the practitioner practice with ethical conscience, dignity, and high professional standard, which will in turn enhance the image of the profession and give confidence to the public. Actually, this is a lift from the preamble um, to the medical code of ethics. So we'll, we'll, we'll want to create awareness of general principles of medical ethics and help clarify the scope and limits of the duty of a doctor faced with a patient's refusal to give consent to life-saving medical treatments. So let's start with it. With, to remind ourselves of the medical oath. So on the day you were admitted to practice medicine or dentistry, or, or dentistry, so this is what the oath sounds like. I, Dr. Dash, do sincerely and solemnly declare that as a registered medical um, or dental practitioner in Nigeria, I shall exercise the several parts of my profession to the best of my knowledge and ability for the good, safety, and welfare of all persons committing themselves to my care and attention. And I will faithfully, I wish I can on this underline that word faithfully, obey the rules and regulation of the Medical and Dental Council of Nigeria and all other laws that are made for the control of the medical and dental profession in Nigeria. So there are three interrelated concepts we'll, we'll, we'll also look at as we engage in some of these cases. One is ethics, the second is law, and the third is medical standard. So law and ethics, um, when we say law, that means that the laws of Nigeria 
um, guide the practice of medicine. And it's important that we have a general idea of what those laws are. You know, so you have the Medical and Dental Practitioners Act, which we're going to take a look at a little bit briefly, nothing to worry about. Um, so you have the Medical and Dental Practitioner Act that, that establishes the MDCCA, that, that establishes Medical and Dental um, Council, as it were. So they are, it's a creation of law. It establishes the council that prescribes the standards, um, the minimum standards and the skill that is required for uh, persons who wants to be admitted to read, um, the, to, to engage into the medical profession in Nigeria. So you also have the code of medical ethics, um, which is also made by the council. You have the criminal code and penal code. Um, strangely, they talk about medicine and the practice of medicine. Then you have International Code of Medical Ethics, that's the Venice Declaration. Then you have Patients' Bill of Rights in your, in the body of, um, the, in the package, you actually have it, and I'm sure we'll get to a point where we just basically just look at it. That's a very recent development, the, which I think every doctor should have. The Consumer Protection Council, um, which is now, what's the name of this, FCCPC, um, that the law um, establishing CPC has now given way to FCCPC, Federal Consumer Protection, you know, something there in, in Mitama. They came together with the Federal Minister of Health and provided a code of patient's bill of rights. And that's what we thought um, in, in this training, we make available to every participant so that you know precisely what um, the rights of patients are. And then of course there are correlated duties. You know, usually with every right, there's also the, the flip side of the right is actually um, a duty. This, this basically will, will help you. Uh, federal and state ministries of health, they, they actually have provisions in their regulations, bylaws um, that govern the, the place, especially the location where hospitals are. And then you find different little, little things like, oh, your signboard, um, you know, and a number of things just come, you know, local government and all that. It's important that, um, the hospital or the healthcare practitioner um, adverts its mind very quickly to um, ancillary kind of protocol people who can take care of the stress of some of these um, some of these people. One of the things that we deal with in the office very regularly is um, AMAC coming to say, "Oh, you need to." You need to pay this. If not, we'll lock up your premises. You need to pay for waste disposal. You need to do this. And hospital business is too serious to be distracted with those kind of, of things. I mean, even in war situations, I mean, there's war in Ukraine. Um, the international code of international of, of conflict and rules of engagement. You are not supposed to touch um, the hospital, but unfortunately, we were, we're in a society where sometimes some of those things are not respected. So my 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 advice, usually to hospital owners and administrators, very quickly is, as soon as you start, ensure that there are people who are delegated to handle um, protocols, regulatory issues, may be a lawyer, may not be a lawyer, it may be somebody in admin who can handle a number of those things so that the core issue of provision of healthcare, um, you can face, your, your practitioners can operate in peace. And then you have the National Health Act, then you also have the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Um, the Constitution is what provides that when we, when we get to talking about it, consent, 
The constitution is what provides that fundamental right. Uh, for example, that tells me that you can't um, you can't invade my privacy. You can't you can't touch me without uh, without my without my consent. Alex, let me let me digress a little bit. A, a politician, Alex Alex Oti, walked into a hospital one day. You know, celebrated banker. Um, he's become a politician now. Walked into a hospital in Lagos, and uh, he had he had some issues. I can't I can't remember the name right now, but it was a swelling in his in, uh, I mean in the anus, and he he uh, his comp this 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 this, uh, this this is a court case. But it's not one of the cases we are going to review. And so he said, according to him, the swelling is obvious, but he does not want surgery. So he checked in, he came into the hospital and made the complaint. The doctor looked at it and said, okay, you will need a surgery. So the debate basically was, because this, this matter actually got to court. He said he was, um, they gave him drugs and made him sleep. And when I woke up, I discovered that some parts of my body was missing. So he sued the hospital for a hundred billion naira. He sued the hospital for a hundred billion naira, and the records, um, and the records of the courts, the records that the doctors took between when he came in at about six um, p.m. to the hospital had to be examined. And um, of course, he lost. He lost. He lost the case. He lost the case because, um, luckily and fortunately, the doctors, the doctors did everything they were supposed to do by virtue of documentation. And that was what saved. That was basically what saved them. But if if they had not done that it will have been an issue of paying very heavily for that. Now, the basis of that case was basically, his complaint was that you invaded into my, into my privacy. You administered drugs that made me sleep. He said, well, I just, I just found myself sleeping. And when I woke up, some parts of my body was gone. <laughs> You know, sometimes when we use those words informed consent, we don't understand the very basis of it. The reason is because every adult in his full grown senses has the full constitutional rights based on the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and the African Charter of Human Rights to the privacy of his body and not even um, when you have a good intention to help him can remove that right even if it is at the risk of his life and so that that is the very basis and foundation for that form that consent that consent form and so where the man is um wheeled into the hospital for emergency and there is need for emergency um emergency care or surgery or something. So while the entire attention of the healthcare um, practitioners, the nurses, the medical people, the surgeon, the doctors, someone should not forget the legal dimension, the protocols, the checklists. What are we really, really supposed to do? So that's, that's, that's very crucial. Um, Luckily, the, the hospital got away with that. So um, to pra the practice of med medicine and dentistry as, as appropriate shall be conducted in accordance with standards, decorum, and by methods um, that are judged acceptable and appropriate by the generality of registered members of the medical 
and dental professions. And um, I mean, as a lawyer, when, when someone asks me, to, oh, please, you know, help me confirm if this right, if this land, if this property is okay for me to buy. What I use, my, my often used um, example now is that I, I'm sure that no doctor would pre prescribe for COVID, drink, take garlic, take onions, mix it with ginger. Um, you know, Nigerians came up with a number of um, local remedies for COVID. And I'm not too sure if some doctors also don't take it. So even if you take it, I'm sure you will not write it in your prescription note. I mean, um, I, I want to be sure. I don't... <laughs> Am I right, Ma? I'm sure, yes. I'm sure no doctor will write in the prescription. Why? The reason is basically is that um, there are standards, uh, there are decorums, and there are acceptable methods. Um, brings me to mind Dr. Abalaka. Dr. Abalaka, you remember Dr. Abalaka's uh, case in the about 10, 15 years um, ago. Um, he said he had um, the cure to HIV and um, it, it, it got, this also got in the court, as it were, because uh, MDDCN said, well, if you have the cure, well, submit the formula, submit this. He said, you know, I think he, I think he refused or something. And um, the, the investigative panel of the, of, of the medical council wrote a letter inviting him. Um, of course, he said, look, I won't get justice here. So he went, he, he quickly went, he quickly ran to court. And the whole opera basically and the concerns of the medical um, profession, the institutional medical profession is that there are standards and decorum and methods that are judged acceptable and appropriate by the generality of registered members of the medical and dental profession. In medical negligence, let me check this in. Um, a doctor is negligent if his colleagues agree that he's negligent. That's, that's the general um, standard. It's a duty of care. Uh, and that's the reason why medical, the, the, the medical investigative panel are uh, made up of, I think, both lawyers and doctors. And they are very harsh. Very, let me not say harsh, they are strict. In, in, in like, I read a lot, a plethora of medical law cases, and we're going to see some. In a lot of them, you will find that the, the medical um, and dental disciplinary tribunal finds the erring doctor guilty. But when it goes to court, because lawyers are more liberal than doctors. The courts look at it from a completely different perspective. But the, the statistics reveal very clearly that the standards being used by the tribunal is often more strict than, um, than that of the general standards of duty of care expected of anybody. So ethical duty and responsibility. It's important that you are familiar with the code of medical ethics. Practice with conscience and dignity as guided by the code and to avoid ethical violations practice. Um, a number of them we're going to look at um, shortly. So the preamble to the code of medical ethics states, every medical and dental practitioner should familiarize themselves with the provisions of this code so that he or she will practice the profession with conscience and dignity within the limits of the provisions of this code. I know that medical ethics is one of the courses in medical school. It looks like for most doctors, as soon as you are done in medical school, that's, that's the last. I don't... Am I... Am I correct? Have I just made a wrong statement? And you know, because it can determine, it can determine, we're dealing with 
matters that can actually take your license off. Like you will see in the cases we are going to look at, I have taken time to look at the costs of medical litigation. And this cost is not just in money, it's in time within the Nigerian legal system. None that's gotten to the Court of Appeal is less than 10 years. As a matter of fact, none is less than 15 years. None. When I say none, I mean none. That's, um, and that's, 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 that's very scary. To have a 10, Dr. Okonko's case, which we have been one of our cases, took about 19, 19 years. Nine, about 19 years. Um, a Sabonos case, which had to do with Jehovah's Witness, transfusion of blood and, and no transfusion of blood, was 1997. The, 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 the case was 1997. The Supreme Court disposed of that case in um, 2021, 2021, 1920, 1997. So the child that because had to do with a child that was born. The controversy was about the child that was born and whether or not it was right to give her blood or not give her blood. She was um, anemic at, at birth. So medical litigation is costly. The least of the cost is money. And the greatest is time. The greatest is time. And so it's important to acquire the skills, the learning, and, the, and, and give it the attention that it takes. And, and it's not just for doctors, even for lawyers. It, it amazes me how careless um, my colleagues um, can be in the practice of their profession. Pharmacists, medical laboratory scientists, and a number of them practicing without um, due attention to the rules and the code of ethics that regulates your practice. And, and you find out that a lot of times you're taking courses in the core, whatever that core is in the area of your specialization. Or you just have this, and just a little bit of the knowledge of this could just could just save you as it were. Just say, oh no, I won't do this. Sorry. And the reason why you are taking that decision at the support of the moment is because of your knowledge. The problem, the, 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 the litigations we are going to take a look at, it didn't come knocking with notice that this is how it's going to turn out. You're a doctor, you're in the consulting room, and um, and something just turns. So in the office, we handled one recently. We're done with it. We try as much as possible to do a lot of out-of-court settlement and arbitration. The doctor, the gynecologist, you know, was, was consulting. And the, the, the lady, sorry, like I said, the medical times, you will excuse my ignorance when it comes to that. But basically, she could not give birth um, normally. With every pregnancy, it gets terminated. So the doctor, will, the gynecologist will have to come in to look at the issue. So he, you know, he's been with the family for some time and she's delivered one. And then five years after she got pregnant again, and she came to the clinic and um, has to do with tying something. I mean, thank you. Uh, what was this, sir? Uh, something like that, you know, tying something so that it doesn't get off. And so that procedure was carried out. You know, that procedure was, was, was carried out. And she was supposed to be on bed rest in the hospital after that procedure. Normally from the, um, from the procedures and standards and regulations. But she said, no, she, she, was, she was fine. And um, that she was going home. And so she went home. This was Thursday. Um, on Friday, the consultant traveled, that's the gynecologist, the consult, consultant gynecologist traveled out of Abuja, traveled out of town. And um, on Friday, she came to the hospital, she was bleeding. She met a young, um, she met a young doctor. 
So the, the young doctor told her she needs to stay in the hospital for examination since she was bleeding. She said no, that she just wanted a drug, that there was a particular drug that Dr. So and so, that's the gynecologist, had given her. She said, no, sorry, I can't, you can't determine the prescription that I gave you. So she called the doctor. The doctor was somewhere out of town doing something completely different. He told him, she told him that no, whatever the doctor tells you, you just do it. Cut a long story short, she left in anger, she left the hospital. And then um, I was in church on Sunday that week, because you know, when they called me, the husband and this patient, she lost the baby on Saturday. And according to her, she got depressed and she came, she invaded the hospital with her husband, started scattering everywhere, threw stones, broke bottles, broke this, broke that. So the first thing I did was to call for the medical records. That's what I always do. And that's what anybody will do when there's a problem. So I looked at the medical records. The doctor had actually wrote in the medical, in the file, you know, from the beginning and all that. So he wrote that she came, he wrote detailed the engagement, the things she said, and that. So there, in, on the medical records, there was, he, he noted that um, this was the advice that she should stay on bed rest and that she declined. The only thing he didn't do, which she would have done, was to give her the, um, there should be a provision where she signs that she's taking a decision outside professional prescription and judgment and advice. Um, but it was documented that that decision was there. Um, I looked at that, I noted that. Um, I noted the second time she came to the hospital, when she said he, his documentation, young doctor, for his documentation, glad, glad. As soon as I saw the record, I said, Wow, we're good for a fight. You know, lawyers know how to fight. <laughs> I just said, We are good for a fight. Now, the reason why I was confident I was ready for the fight I was going to take was what I saw on the record. And so, the, the, the documentations are. Uh, which is prescribed by the ethical um, codes is very crucial. Sometimes that's, that, that might just be the only thing that saves you. I mean, like the joke, I mean, who knows? My writing is bad. <laughs> it's ever so penal. If the document is ever so penal, I'll just tell them that, well, that's what exactly, I, that's exactly what I meant. So, this is the preamble to the Code of Medical Ethics, thus bringing the incidents of ethical violations to the barest minimum, as ignorance of the law will not be an excuse for any ethical violation. It is the song of the lawyer that ignorance of the law is no excuse. If there's a problem, unfortunately, we'll have to go back to the law. It's like the teacher and the marking scheme. You know, if you work with a marking scheme, then it's easy for you to realize very clearly that you can't fail. And there's a marking scheme. The, mark, the marking scheme is a medical code of ethics. So let's look at basically something we all know, just to remind ourselves, um, it will help us as we look at the, um, as we get into the breakout session briefly. MDPC, that's the Medical Dental Practitioners Council, is by law charged with the responsibility of reviewing and preparing from time to time a code of conduct for medical practice in Nigeria. This portion to this that the council established the code of medical ethics. So this is the legal framework for medical practice in, in Nigeria. And the council is so crucial that even if you decide to practice outside Nigeria, there's, there's what you call certificate of good conduct, I think. Good standing, yes. So you have a, the, you, you have a, a certificate of, of good standing that the medical um, council will have to give you. I, I doubt if 
any jurisdiction will admit you to practice medicine within there without, without that because it's not enough it's not just enough that you are intelligent because it's a it's a it's a highly regulated um industry globally it's important that your name your good name is not is not staying and unfortunately you have wonderful people great people whose whose name is just unnecessarily dented because of lack of knowledge of medical ethics and and that's just that's just the that, that's just the honest truth um tega isagunos case the one the supreme court decided in 2021 dr Fawe is presently practicing in uh, in in the us and uh, that's one of the cases in which it stumps up for the as a matter of fact i believe every, that out of all the cases i believe every doctor should read Esabono's case every hospital administrator should go through a Sabonos case. We're going to take a look at it. So um, the, the Medical Council, so the, the, the Medical and Dental Practitioners Act establishes the Medical Council, um, the investigation panel. And so in practical terms, when someone is angry with a doctor for whatever reason it is, he writes the council. They're in Prince and Princess, just behind Prince and Princess. We all know it. So they write a petition to the council and um, the panel is created to look at it um, and, and carry out a preliminary inquiries Of course, they're going to give you the opportunity to talk and, um, and write back. And then you now have, if they are satisfied, they frame a charge, it's a quasi-criminal, usually kind of a quasi-criminal proceedings. And the tribunal is equal to the high court in the sense that an appeal can only lie from the tribunal to the court of appeal. So the medical and dental um, practitioners tribunal is equivalent in jurisdiction. If you're, if you're there, you're actually facing the high courts. They have their own rules and they have their own way of, um, they have their own procedure. So, uh, what are the functions of the council? Um, the, the law gives the council the power to determine the standards of knowledge and skill to be attained for practice. Two, review and prepare the code of conduct. Um, three, supervise and control practice of alternative medicine. And then four, regulate operations of clinical laboratories in pathology please you can stop me at any point in time to either ask me to clarify or make contributions um but we'll get to a more i i'm, I'm happy i just want to read um reel out the basics so that we can have a better platform for engagement and interaction Ethical standards. A physician shall always maintain, maintain the highest standards of professional conduct. You find that in, in Rule 8 of um, the Medical Ethics, the Code of Medical Ethics. So Rule, rule 8 also says a, a physician shall always bear in mind the obligation of preserving human life. So the standards are important. So it says, I must bear um, the highest standards of professional conduct. Um, traditionally, there are three professions that stay on the, and that's not because I'm a lawyer, the doctor, the lawyer, and the priest. That's why they have uniforms. <laughs> So um, I'd like us to, we have three case studies and I'd like us to take a look at, at them. So we're just basically going to, I think we should get a drink um, at this point so we can um, have a relaxed, I don't know how we're going to do this. 
So I need I need numbers for the participants who are medical. I need numbers to be taken now, so we can just have a discussion into groups. We can have three groups, I'm sure, three or four groups. Now we'll have to a little bit get. Um, we, we need to rearrange the table. So how do we do it? Can we? Can we make suggestions as to that? But what I want us to do is we're going to look at the first case and make, look at the ethical issues it raises. And each group is going to make a presentation and say, look, identify them. So group one, group two, group three. So group one, group two, group three. Is that okay? Is that fine? Do we need to make sorry? No, the, we can we can re uh, order the table. As a matter of fact, group one can move to the back because you really need to read. Uh, we have like fifteen minutes for this. Um, the I thought, okay. So on the on you, there is a, on on your card. Sorry, on your folder you have. You have this, so you have. So you have. Can, can, can you help me look at the? Okay, the first thing we I think we need to do is first of all get into the groups in a, in such a way that we're seated maybe around the table, kind of around the table, kind of around, kind of around. The table. So while doing this, can we get a drink? Can we get? a drink on, on it so that yeah thank you so so you are going to be looking at this one so on your Okay, um, online participants, I must apologize, Dr. Iseko had um, sent a caveat earlier that the interactive sessions may not get um, so much across to you. But what basically is happening is uh, we have three case studies and um, the first case is about to be examined and uh, we have three we have three groups in a breakout session and um, they are just basically going to deliberate for 15 minutes um, and come out with the medical um, issues in there and each group will dedicate delegate um, a spokesman who is going to just come out and let us know where you are identifying so can you just so you need someone to write for the group and then someone who is going to make the presentation for the group. But now we are, we are doing um, case, case one. So you'll find case one. So what, what we're doing is case one. So the, So case study one, please assign somebody that will be your spokesperson that we can present our cases. So that's going to be briefly. We have about 10 to 15 minutes. Then 15 minutes, identify the ethical issues 
and then we we'll just uh, talk about the briefly. Can I have your breakfast as we are discussing? If you are online, just hang on in the next 10 15 minutes, we'll start discussing. I'm just asking for the case details. Um, just a minute, I'll make an attempt to, sh to share some of the case details. <laughs> so the two cases, So the two cases online for the online audience, the two cases are cases of um, blood transfusion related um, events, which we'll be discussing now. Um, can somebody help you one of the cases? Let me just read it out for them. Yes, the case. So the, so the case one that we are going to be discussing for the online audience, case one we are discussing is um, Dr. John Okonko uh, versus the Medical and Dental Practitioners Display Tribunal. So the case is about Mrs. Okori, a 29-year-old woman, um, having had a delivery at maternity on the 29th, was admitted at Kenaya Hospital in Onitsha for nine days. Um, complained of difficulty in walking and severe pain in the peak area. So that's case one. Um, her diagnosis, she was diagnosed with severe anemia. 
and blood transfusion was recommended. The patient and her husband refused because of their Jehovah Witness status. And then Dr. Okafo of that hospital subsequently um, made them sign a dama and they referred them. She was taken to another private hospital. Dr. Okonko decided to proceed and treat the patient without transfusing blood as they had requested. However, a patient died after five days and um, a petition was written by the uncle and the mother of the, of the patients to the medical and dental tribunal and Dr. Koko was charged. So the charge was that it was clear that it was a severe anemia and he agreed to admit the patient and give the patient treatment without transfusing blood she died. And that he claimed his inhibition for failure to apply the correct, he failed to transfer the patient to a bigger center, and um, that is the inhibition to transfer the patient did not operate to the patient advantage. So, he, in this regard, the second count of objections were that of that he allowed his religious constitution to influence his treatment. So, it is from this, it's presumed that it's likely a Jehovah witness. So, that's Mrs. Okori's case with Dr. Okonko, case study one. Dr. Anwili, I hope that helps. Um, discussion. We are about to go into the discussion fully. And um, other participants online, you are welcome. Dr. Walikon, you are welcome. Um, Dr. Aisha to Sally, you are welcome. So we'll continue the discussion. Um, discussion for case two is Tega Esabuno and Anno versus Dr. Tunde Faweya and others. So this case, Tega Esabuno, a one month old child, rushed to Chevron Clinic by his mother, a Jehovah witness. The pediatrician on duty, Dr. Fawea, found the child to be suffering severe infection and anemia, prescribed antibiotics. However, the child kept on getting worse, had poor breathing, was convulsing, he gave the child oxygen, and it became obvious to you that the child didn't put on to survive. The mother refused, uh, being a member of Jehovah witness, that she cannot consent. Um, according to the case, he went on to transfuse blood and the child survived. The case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the child, by the time the Supreme Court decided this, the child was about 22 years old, alive and you know. So, what medical legal issues does this case throw up? What would you do if you're Dr. Fawaya? What are the facts that this case raises? And if you're a hospital administrator, what would you do? What would you do? So, those are the cases that we are discussing now. Um, and then we'll take it from there. so we're we'll discussing the case now shortly and uh, different groups will be discussing first and then we'll take it from there Oh, all right, round up, round up. Can we get back to our seats? Can we get back to our seats so that we can get some? We have many more cases to discuss. So let's get back to our seats. Thank you. I know this case, we can continue from now to tomorrow. So the earlier we stop, the better. So case one. Um, so group one, can we come present? Group one, group two, group three. Choose your presenter and come present. Please, um, but Marisawa, but Marisawa, the other cases, can you put them on a flash drive or form a PowerPoint so that we can put, we can project for the other people? 
PKI history. History. You can put it as a PowerPoint. So we'll just discuss it together. Okay. You put the history together. You make PowerPoint. Let's do PowerPoint so that we can share with you online. Be online. Yes. We can make it like PowerPoint. And we'll discuss it together so that we, we, we use less time. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. We are done. Frank Courts of Justice. Can we come back to our seats? Dr. Akola Wale. I will come back to our seats. So group one, Dr. Alta Office here in group. Group one, let's, let's come back to our seats. Group one, please take your, your time to present this now. Okay, great. Our learned colleague. <laughs> Dr. Bright from group one. <laughs> No, 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 just go straight to the, to the case questions. We already read out the cases for the online audience, and all of us in house already have our cases. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Bright. I believe we've gone through a uh, case study one. And uh, the question is uh, identify the medical legal issues and prescribed course of action. So we can see that in this case, I think there should have been a proper documentation that uh, the patient actually refused the uh, blood transfusion. And the uh, patient was initially referred to another hospital and Dr. Okoko actually, actually accepted this patient, knowing fully well that the patient had refused the uh, blood transfusion. So he should have documented that the patient, uh, proper documentation that this patient uh, actually refused the uh, blood transfusion. And uh, he would have accepted the patient as well if there are uh, ability of alternate treatment apart from blood transfusion. So if there are other alternative treatment, the second doctor, because here in the case, they didn't mention the first doctor. It was the second doctor that was actually So, so the first thing you said was that he should have signed the COVID form or No, they would have gotten the patient to sign the consent form. That he doesn't want transfusion. He doesn't want transfusion. Okay. And then the second thing you said- So he would have accepted the patient if he knows there are alternate, alternative treatment. Because if there is no alternative treatment, I don't think uh, there's need for him to accept that patient. Okay. So he would have done wrong if he accepted that patient when he knows there's no alternative treatment. Okay. And secondly, uh, we would have also got to, uh, other family members to be aware and also sign. Because we realized that uh, the mother and the uncle actually sued this doctor, which I believe that probably they may not be of the same fate. And uh, I think in, in situations like this, the, the mother of the, of the wife, mother of the wife, yes. And uh, most times they, they won't even be there when all these things are happening. Exactly. You know, at the end of the day, when the patient eventually the issues come, so this is when you see them, you know, they will all come up. And uh, I think in cases like this, other members of the family should also be kept, you should get them involved as well. You know, so as to, you know, get is, is it legally right to bring somebody in to discuss on the patient's medical history? With the consent of the patient. With the, if, would the woman give consent for you to discuss her record yeah, you can. and know that with a third party? With the consent of the patient, you can, I think so. Okay. Not okay. as am I right? Yeah. Yes. We, <laughs> With the consent of the patient. So those are, those are some questions you have to bring about. You are, you are very right. So I, I didn't know you should do. Okay, so what well, I'm uh, talking about pres prescribed course of action. And I think uh, if the doctor doesn't have alternative uh, treatment and uh, such a patient is being referred to you, uh, I would say that uh, you should actually refer the patient. You shouldn't allow the patient to stay. I think that's the best course of action. 
So, okay, thank you very much. So, case study one, let's give a round of applause. Yeah, so we'll start from your own team. All right, case study two. So, case study two, I think. That's a Sabono and Nobis of Studio Fire and all that. Yeah, they are all related anyway. But uh, I think uh, something uh, that is different here is that uh, who gets the consent for the minor? Uh, this is a child. And in most cases, uh, in some countries, it's believed that uh, the state owns the child and not the parent. And here, the parent actually refused the uh, transmission of blood. What are the lines of action? What are you supposed to do as a medical practitioner? Here, I'm thinking that we should get the hospital legal and ethical committee to actually decide on this, on this case, actually. So they have to look into it. Sometimes they might have to get a court uh, junction that overrides the mother's decision. If the hospital don't have a legal and ethical committee, you are the owner of the hospital and you only know, you are your nurses and a junior doctor, what then would you do? I think we have to refer the patient. <laughs> if you refer the patient and the patient dies and roots, this, this child was convulsing, requiring oxygen therapy, mm. right? Poor breathing, according to the case. Now, if the child dies and roots to this is Lagos, I mean, right? If, if you die in Chevron Clinic from Lecky, the dies and roots to Luth, who bears responsibility? Well, the first thing one is supposed to be here first is to make sure you. You will get the parents to sign uh, against medical advice. That's the first thing. That's to protect yourself. Before then, you can uh, start, uh, uh, you know, you, you deciding know that on what to do. Duty of care does not transfer until it the child has been received by the referral center. Anything that happens between the time of your decision and the child's death, you are still responsible yeah. until that place receives. Still own the care patient. The patient died in your care. Will it be even right to put that child in transport? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you must have done all you can. You know, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm the ad, acting devil's advocate. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you put the child inside, and I, and I now come to you and I argue that your action of putting the child in an ambulance or in a car. Moving in Lagos heat and stayed on Ted Milan Bridge for four hours before he got killed the child, not in condition. That you are the one. But if you had even kept the child in the hospital, the child will be alive. In fact, you had a flat tire on the road where they were going. And you know the child is still under your care until somebody collects. So there was a flat tire, you had to stay on Ted Milan Bridge. Then they told the car up like this. <laughs> Sorry, one house, one house. When you come up, I will greet you like this. Any direction you go, I will tell you the other way. The best you can really do is to either manage them and do the way the program put it and manage them in trouble, or if you think the other things that can be done elsewhere, you can refer them to that elsewhere. Of, of course, that always comes with the risk of something happening in between. Okay, but it's better to die trying, die trying to get and get out. Get future, die trying. Absolutely. So uh, <laughs> that risk is always the opportunity. All right, thank you very much. Are there any other um, issues you have? Any issues with this case? All right, thank you very much. Yeah, one. Very nice, very nice. Group two. Group two, over to you. Who is your spokesperson? Dr. Akola Wale, the erudite professor himself, and chief of dermatology at the Union Hospital. That is almost everything, though. I don't know. <laughs> it's almost everything that say, we talk about. Uh, yes, sir. yes, sir. Thank you, sir. My pleasure to be here. So, like in case one, almost it's just going to be like reputation, but uh, like we said, there are still few cases where people change their mind. People actually have problems called poor insights and beliefs are not truths. So, when you show them two or three cases that have died from wrong belief, some of them can change their mind. Right? So, it's very you continue to educate them. Most religions believe, including the one everybody knows, we are not scientific. 
So you keep working. So awareness, then you keep using influencer on them to make sure that you know they can use influencer will help you. One person in the family can save you from religious programming for being so for the they inform me. So let the kids die cloud. So very important. One of them that we encourage out of settlement and co and people from being so is relationship with the family. So if you have a relationship, try to be sympathizing with them, try to go to them when they are dead. I mean, they are dead. I mean, they Beautiful. Have a dead you are saying you are bringing in yes, influencers. Yes, influencers. The question of consensus comes in. Yes, sir. I brought in somebody else who is not going to have access to patient confidential information. Is that not a breach of confidentiality? Yes, sir. It is, but there's a way around it, like I've said. Most of these things, when you look legally, most of anybody can get you on podcast. But when there's a relationship in between, when the system is really, weak, when you have good relationship, good rapport with the family, everything goes. Even when you are wrong, they help you out. So relationship with the family, relationship with the influencer, with the continuous engagement is really? very, very important. Very, very important. I, I will argue yes, sir. that this man had a very good relationship with the husband, that they agreed to stay and watch the woman progressively die. When the Wahala now came, it came from other members of the family. We have started calling to her village in, um, in Nando, and we should leave Okuzu and start coming to meet them in Enugu before he now start getting a, um, the relationship. So, but well, you know, in living, some, some of our friends can be in US, and we talk to them. Hold, 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 hold. So there's one or two person that, can, that is a medical person who is the medical priest of the family. Once he says something, everybody died down. Let me talk to Uchuku. Is the one that holds the family. So once you're able to get that kid, it beats them down. Whatever they're going to be part of the settlement. But when that man is informed, the member of the family, everybody's curious. They want to kill him. They are coming with knife. Because they have told them that if they have informed him, something will have happened. So apart from what the done documentation and all that we talk about, relationship and endangerment in the family, again, influenza, a good medical system, we don't have to wait. The Bible talks about the wise men seeing trouble from afar and preparing himself. But the poor does not even consume. So what that means is that in a country where there are hawks and everything, people will eat you raw. So you must be there to, to be strategic, expect this to have a set of system. In Lili, we have very good system, legal system. We have good system, our record system involved that, our procedure involved that. Even my procedure, there's no procedure I do that will not fix cancer. Even the even even transit your room. So these things mean that we continue to engage our system and, get, and the medical legal system too. You inform your your, 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 your CEO, your employer, to tell them, because one head, you know, the Bible says one put a thousand to ten thousand. So what that means is that when you invoke to so you bring more people so that more people can be sued, that and you, no, not only you should be sued. <laughs> no, I mean, you need your compost. When you have okay, a problem, I, 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 yes. so when you have a problem like that, people have experiences, people want to share, people want to collaborate, and nobody knows all of it. Yes. So you have to continue to engage yourself, thing. engage your lawyers, engage everybody. One of the key things on this case, at least the first case, was that it seemed it seems like a one-man sure. um, show. Sure. When you bring in more people in the model of counselors and safety, yeah. and um, just showing that more people were involved, one of my consultants when I was training used to say, to catch one physician, to catch one physician is hard. To catch two physicians is very hard. If two physicians have agreed on the matter, can to cut three physicians that they must have been serious in that all of them together. It is very, very hard. So when you bring in more people, they put their inputs, no, we should have done this, we could have, we could have that's a very good course of action. Fine. Exactly. We're also talking about um, having to pay for job. Oh, fine. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> there are the same directions. <laughs> They may all be blind because if you're blind, everybody is there. <laughs> so we talk about preparing for them. Like there should be prompt attendance. You know these people will come. Some of them, some hospitals, when the people, parents are, I mean, they are not pregnant, they can put in some blood. Prepare them that this can happen. So if you show all this, what you want, what are the, what are you going to do about it? You are living now. What are we doing? Your mother does not allow even self-transmission. You cannot even donate your own blood. And mm -hmm. give yourself back. Exactly. Yeah, so they don't even allow that. So, so that doesn't yeah. happen. So these are some of the things. And then knowing that duty of care does not end with you, that it's done. It, it, until everything is okay, your duty of care does not exist there. That means that you must continue to engage the patient, follow up the patient. You refer, so you are free. I don't think so. The case will go back to you at any time. So duty of care does not mean you protect yourself. You say the patient is perfectly yours, you do. 
continuously know them, and you must actually be, take part in sending the patient to the right place where they have capacity, capability. This are, um, you have to follow them up what they have been done because if anything happens, it will eventually you know, pass back to you. So these are some of the things we talk about. And then we talk about injunction, especially in children where the, the consent is not and the parent is insisting and there's no time. The court injunction online can even be done online. A lot of documents can be done online with the latest act of legal in Nigeria. So you can do a lot away from where you are. Yeah, and send a consent from an high court order to those to protect you. But all this have been said before. I'm just highlighting some of what we say. So these are some of the few things we talk about. Thank you very much. Let's let's give a round of applause. Lenin <laughs> very good, very good, very good. One of the key things to take away is that prevention is better than cure. Preventing litigation is better than winning litigation. Imagine that his license was taken away while they were deciding this case. And 18 years after, they now say, okay, you won the case. Take back your license. <laughs> what, what will you do with it? There's nothing. So preventing it, so all these things he has talked about, getting in between people, um, discussing the wider reach of people, um, building a good rapport, is all critical beside the case. Then getting caught in junction in the case of a refused in, um, consent. In this case, if I remember care carefully, they sent, if I remember the case well, they sent the woman out and they transferred the, the child in the woman's absence. That is the case. They transferred the, yeah, the second case. They transferred the child in the woman's absence. And then while they were transfusing, they sent somebody to the courts while they were transfusing and got the court. A court injunction, a court magistrate to give something. So it was based on those that they hid their case on and it continued to arrive. So I think they did what was necessary in that regard. And their documentation was on point. I think throughout this day, I'm going to hear documentation, documentation. What you write in that file is not just for you, it will save your neck. Okay, so and then you must, I'll go forward to say that you must do everything to prove. And your documentation is intact. So for example, even if you have documentation, if somebody can prove that this thing you wrote is after the facts, that you just put date and time separately, then it shows a big case open. So you must put things that can tell the courts and tell other people that this documentation is intact. It was not done after the fact. It was not put in. One of my teachers in uh, postgraduate made sure now, when we get into ICU, especially for bad stroke cases, the first thing he does is to number the entire case notes. And the first thing he does, number one, number two, number three, till his own documentation, then he now documents and numbers and things. And he taught me that. So that if anything happens, if he cannot find key numbers, problem. So if you want to, and he mentioned that his writing starts in, at the end of somebody's write-up into another person's write-up, into half of a page. Now, for you to remove his own, you must remove three, four people's own at the same time. Okay, maybe that's paranoid, but <laughs> all right. We, like we said before, we cannot sell spare parts. This is the only business we do. Okay, okay um, group three. Group three, can we give a hand of applause for them? <laughs> group three, led by Dr. Akafa, Chief Family Physician in the hospitals. So great. Thank you. I want to thank our uh, colleagues from group one and two. You have done very, very well. Yeah, very well. Yeah, I'm a politician too. So you have uh, looked at the cases in your own perspective and in your own view. We group T, three, two, we have looked at it at our own angle. So we're going to take it this way. The topology type people that stopped. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the question for our group, which belongs to all of us, identify the medical issues for case one. If you look at that case very well, you will notice that uh, the first thing the doctor did was that he kept that patient for too long for us. He kept that patient for too long. And then we also observed that we feel he has, because we don't have the documentation of that particular field, 
we can hazard a guess that maybe he has positive of evidence and knowledge, especially in respect of alternatives. Because usually, if somebody is a witness and he comes to the hospital as a physician or a doctor, you have this idea of taking a proper history. And usually, they will tell you, I don't take this. This is what I take. Okay. So I feel that, or we feel that, the whole felt that the doctor did not explore the history in detail. So his knowledge in that aspect, we feel, is poor. Well, he was in Enugu, came patient with yes. discharge in Enugu. Correct. Maybe, you can feel the city, your maybe, knowledge will be low. So the emphasis is that. Maybe there was nothing available in that city. We didn't see him asking. That is what we are going to do. We didn't even see him asking. He would have even asked. Because you, you know, in the living hospital, we do that. Sorry, I'm not against Enugu. I'm just Yes, <laughs> yes. In the living hospital, we do that. When they said, they don't, don't do, I don't do blood because of my feet. So since there's a religious barrier, we say, what do you do? They tell us, where can we get it? They tell us, do you have a number? That's what we practice. You have any connection, any link, we call. Even labels we call. There was one, particularly in our hospital, we had to call another place to ask. She was pregnant and she said, okay, during her pregnancy, she will take this. We made an arrangement for her. So if you're- With, with proper signing. Yes, with proper documentation <laughs> and consent. That's very correct. They have like seen offices now. Yes. And before they did not have all of this. It was this 1991 cases. At that time, they did not have it. It's a, it's a recent development. I know we have witnesses in the hospital, doctors that work in the hospital that are witnesses. They go all out, they come out at any time of the day. And there are doctors that can be reached. So typically, every hospital is advised get the number of the week. They will provide those things. Hemacy will show up, they will bring a report at no cost to the patient most time. So, that is something that every hospital should know about. That in every city, and at least in major cities, Enugu, Abuja, Lagos, that there are typically enough people and they have enough network to provide. All the way from the US, they have networks to provide as much as is necessary. So, since it was limited, body knowledge and in whatever aspect, either <laughs> component of the care, he will have referred the patient. But he failed to refer. Failed to refer is also an issue here. And then he will have also, because for us, we're learning, if you have such challenges already, if you're a knowledge based physician like that, you will have to plan to get a legal cover standby. This is what we also do. That's what uh, Dr. Iseko is trying to say here. Documentation, proper documentation, consent, it should be informed and properly kept. But he was helping the patient. The patient didn't have money. If he wants to have a legal cover, but it's our wife, not free. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I'm devil's advocate here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm going to continue to bring up to make sure that it's as real as possible. Yes, yeah, that's very correct. So he did not charge the patient. He said, okay, five, two thousand naira. Where will he not get money to now get take out? In fact, sir, with, 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 with experience, those people that you want to do those kind of things to are the ones that can easily get you into a deep sheet. You don't need more. <laughs> so we have to take we have to take note of that. So yes, indeed, most of the people that end up in trouble typically end up in trouble for who they were trying to help. Yes. Rather than for people that because if this man was not connected to the patient, just felt that or whatever, he would have referred immediately. But when there's that emotional connection, you keep on doing, yes, you keep that, on doing. That, 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 that's true. Yes. So it is true. It's too straightforward too for us. Thank God we have a pediatrician in our midst in our group. At least <laughs> <laughs> that gave us some added advantage, you know. So for this too, we'll just list out the points that. We answer the issue that we just had after the medical issues that uh, the case for us. For us, it's actually the right of the child supersedes the right to life of that child supersedes any other right. The parent or the guardian, they have their rights. But I want us to know that as a doctor, in some instance, you can't collect that parental right from the parents. That's what Dr. Isiko was trying to explain. That for this particular case, that the doctor went ahead and sent the parents away or the guardians away, and then got the case in reduction action. If I'm not quoted out, or I'm not quoted out of context, the lawyer is here, he will correct me. 
you have the right within 72 hours to go ahead and do the proper or appropriate intervention for a child like this. Even if you don't have an injunction, you can get it afterwards. It depends. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is, it's not completely true. Okay. So you can go there and the court can refuse that injunction. Okay. So what happens? Right. Somebody does something. He will come and uh, tidy up that for us. So, but eventually, the procedure that that physician took was okay by getting the court injunction, which is also a right thing. That's it. We can stop here. Sir. Thank you very much. Let's appreciate them. Okay, so we have looked at several issues. Uh, case, case one, case two. So in case one, what do you say about Dr. Okafo? The person that saw the patient first, signed Dama and referred. I'm sure when they only had this case, the way his body will be doing him. <laughs> ah, I can imagine that uh, <laughs> hey, he, he, he missed it, I mean. So he dodged the bullets. He dodged the big bullets. Now the other person, Doctor Okonkwo. Um, there are two ways I want us to look at this. There's another way I want us to look at this. More often than not, it seems to be that single doctor, sole proprietor, smaller hospitals tend to be at the at the end of most medical proceedings. So if if you know that where it's a single specialist in charge of doctors or a smaller up to one specialist or one doctor, you are already at a disadvantage. The last medical and MDCN tribunal that they did, they broadcast it on Facebook. I felt it was maybe inappropriate. I mean, they are the powers. So I watched it on Facebook. I don't remember any case from any teaching hospital many government hospitals, or for many hospitals that were from more than one person. I don't remember any case. Even the private hospitals, it were hospitals of one, two, and three, seven. For all the maybe seven, eight cases that I watched and tried to analyze. Okay, so that already is a problem here. Number two, let's assume that this man also had links with UNTH in the with UNTH. And he knows that UNTA too don't have those things that he will have. This is 1991. Erythropoietin was not widely available, definitely not in the East. Um, uh, C was not widely available. The OIT did not have a network. Let's assume he also knew that going to that teaching hospital may have even been worse. Yes, they would have had specialists to move around and write. Let's assume that he thought so. Um, let's assume the patient was actually even referred and the patient died in the hospital under the circumstances. Do you think it could have been the case? That is, the teacher hospital did exactly what this doctor did, which was likely going to be the case, and the patient died, and they took it to the medical and I mean, tribunal. Do you think it would have been the case? I don't think so. Again, when two physicians have come together, it's difficult. So I believe that he should have taken that extra step to protect him. Number three, when cost becomes a something in your mind while you are treating a patient, you are more likely than not to enter trouble. That is, you are thinking of cost, this patient cannot afford it, but they can afford to sue you. <laughs> they cannot afford it. Ah, should I even cost about? Ah, no, that'll be too much for them. Let me just try. Okay, that's number three, two. Number three, I also believe in case one that I don't think he thought this patient could die, will die. I think he thought that, okay, I'm the thing about the things like this is that very likely he may have succeeded on several locations for similar cases. It is normally one that takes you out. So more food than not, I tell my people, the fact that we escaped this case, this patient went home, does not mean that we will not scrutinize uh, where or where we could have done better. Because th is that one, you have been doing it. You have been giving patients and hematinics, ugu leave, uh, whatever, and they have made it. But the one that does not make it, will you be able to stand legal scrutiny? And um, very important is the uncle and the mother. 
So even if they signed, according to Dr. Kola Ole, even if they had a good rapport, now there's a paper in JAMA, I think it's 1991 or 1990, Journal of American Medical Association, that says that doctors that have a good relationship are less likely to be sued, even when the family knows that what they did directly led to death. That is, the person stabbed the patient. Because, for example, they are less likely to be sued, the case is likely to be taken up at all once there was a good working relationship. That's American Medical Association. While once, the, once they feel the doctor was detached, they are more likely, even when they can see that there was no case, they are more likely to even raise a case. So this is something that should be explored. But then remember that the next of kin may not be the only important person. So one thing we have realized over time is that those people that are called, there's a famous case that happened recently in Lagos, the woman that died in a very big hospital for a guiding surgery, that was a social media trial. They even had music showing the woman as a chef. You know, very touching story. I hope you remember that case. Very touching story. They started with music. She walked into the hospital, did surgery, and they just snuffed her out of her in her prime and all of that. You, I don't know if you remember that case. Now, huh? yes, now, as this case said, that a doctor from abroad or in abroad said they should do this and they did not do it. Despite what the doctor in abroad was saying, they did not, they did not, they did not. And then eventually, it's the court case, Michael Zekemeh, all of them, no, Michael Bakuba, someone like that, I mean, sir. Olisa Abaka, they are the ones pushing the case and the case is, is, is going on and all of that. So um, one of the things I take from that case is that those people were likely discussing with one group of people. They did not discuss with the key decision maker. It could be a mother, an auntie, a doctor, a friend. If you don't explain to that person, you lose the case. You lose the post case. So you lose the case at the time. When is now time for trial? You lose that case too because the person will not agree to settle or to discuss or to even have any understanding. And even if you win after 18 years, like we said, that is still a loss. 18 years of turmoil, 18 years of you sleeping at night. You have one prayer point for 18 years. <laughs> Everybody is saying, Kai. By the time they finished this case, the child was at Finnish University or something like that. By the time they finished this case. Okay, so that is those are things key medical issues that we can take. Uh, Dr. Peter, Dr. Officer, do you have anything to add? Um, what would the hospital administrator do in such cases? The hospital administrator, in my opinion, which I think is a good opinion, the first job of hospital administrator is to make sure that there are protocols, processes, and structure in place. That's the first job. The second job is to make sure that those things are followed. I have a saying, that a running manager is a bad manager. That is any manager you see running, brrr, brrr, something is wrong, it's a bad manager. You know you are dealing with medical practice. You know that this kind of case or cases of this ilk will show up one day, it's a matter of time, right? If you have treated 1,000, like one of my mentors in India said, told me that any surgeon that says he has not made a mistake is a liar or is not practicing. Those are the only two of yours. But if you have got 1,000 cases, they are going to be. So you should, ahead of time, what will we do in this case? So the first thing that the protocols are there for the staff to follow, hospital administrator. Number two, that when it happens, that the protocols are actually followed so that everything is in place. When you call for Barista Hour, you will just come and you'll see documentation, you will see the signed papers, you will see the attempts to refer. There are times when you attempt to refer, and patients say, I'm not referring, I'm not going anywhere. You need to sign that one. You see the attempts to refer, you will see the patient something, you will see. There's a case in, that was done in Lagos recently. A woman sued, I think it's Premier Hospital. They won the case. That was one of the few cases that they publicized. A lot of cases when doctors win, it's not normally publicized, it's when doctors lose. But what was very particular about this case was the documentation. Every 10 minutes they were documenting. And those people were accompanied. <laughs> Parents were told. Mother said, woman, get patient said she's waiting for her husband. 1 a.m., husband still not here. 
1.30 a.m., husband called, said he's on his way, they should, take, they should leave him alone. 1.45, husband said, after the end of that case, I think the court all not only threw it out, asked for, what they call that in this, uh, what reparation of that kind of thing that used to damages that please, 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 please pay them for that, for wasting our time or wasting the court's time. So those documentation were there. The woman was supposed to have CS. She refused CS for the husband. When the husband came, he refused. Eventually, they finally agreed. It was too late. Things went bad, and they now sued. But when they now brought that documentation, how the woman refused, said her husband must be the one to sign. Remember, you know how women in Nigeria do? The husband must be the one to sign and continue until it happened. That saved them. So those documentations are key. And the hospital administrator should, ahead of time, before the cases that take you to court, always start checking all the files that these documentations are on track. It is not when it happens, you now go back and check and say, hey, no. If you have been checking, then everybody's on their toes. You as the hospital, and the hospital director, medical director, must have somebody checking even your own so that they can call your attention. Ah, okay. This one, oh, okay, ah. Okay. When they call you three times, just if not for anything, let the person not call you again. You start writing. When the day will come, you will thank your lucky stars that somebody has been putting you on check. So we know that companies generally have a board of directors, right? Um, doctors, anybody that has power must put in place a system that guards against excessive use of power, which is why in the country you're supposed to have different legislative, executive, and judicial arm, just to put in check. So as a doctor, it is the same thing. You must make sure that you have these systems in place to put in check. Somebody must look at your back. Somebody. And you should be happy when they call your attention. Okay? It's like you prescribe them 40 milligrams of uh, this thing, sir. I don't think it's right. If you shout at that person, you are done. Because the next time, they will not call you. You are on your own. Okay. So those are some things that uh, add to the case. And what will you do if in Fawaya's case, Fawaya did, I don't know if I'll do the same thing. I don't know if I will send the patient out, transfuse, you know, uh, you know, what he did was maverickness and a very strong conviction that this child was live. Now let's put it the other way. What if the child died after he gave transfusion? <laughs> what if the child died? This case is sweet. And I think the court likely voted in favor because the child was alive. And from every look of things, that's, those were the cardinal things that saved the life. What if the child still died or had a blood transmission reaction that can happen? I did not give you consent. You went ahead and gave it. You got a court. Then the child now had transmission reaction. And because of the transmission, the child even died. In fact, it is your transmission that killed the child. So I look at you on the good side. What if the child died? What do you think, sir? If, you <laughs> if the child died, I think it can be a different case. What do you think? It can be a different case altogether. But I can imagine when the Supreme Court were sitting, they sat down, they saw there's a 20 year old child finishing university today because of the actions of this man. If we penalize this man, what are we saying? How about the individual? I think the individual court you know? convict him. No, let me tell you. So let me give you, let me give you, uh, let, let's bring um, Fawaya's case. Thank you. So let's bring Fawaya's case into uh, focus. It happened in Chevron Hospital in Lekki. Um, the, and this is 1991, like you said, I mean, 1997, um, I'm sure the kind of um, alternative prescriptions that we have today, probably they were not there as, as at that time. And so he, um, Dr. Fawaya and the hospital decided to go ahead and give the blood transfusion. While they were doing that, the hospital administrators went to the police. So they got, um, they got the order of the police they went to the magistrate court. This may act, I, my, I believe this must have been done like maybe two days after or three days after. Because the, the case was very unreasonable. 
I mean, it shocked me. The child is alive and they pursued the case to the Supreme Court. I mean, it's, 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 it's crazy. I, I wonder how the child would feel at every stage of the proceedings. So they went to, um, so the way it works is that the police station, there is, there is, you know, the police station went to the magistrates. So um, the magistrate gave an order that a Chevron hospital should do everything that is possible to save the child's life. That's actually the way that kind of order goes, yes. And in Nigeria, that's possible now. You should have, I always tell um, hospitals, don't ever operate in a place without the cooperation and the rapport with the police station around you. This is, this is part of it. During Salah, take rice to them. During Christmas, take something, take a goat or something or whatever it is. <laughs> you know, pay a courtesy, pay a courtesy visit. You know, I mean, even if it's just one room, my hospital is, my clinic is, you know, ensure that you know the DPO, have his number. You know, I mean, this, this is, this is, this is Nigeria. So you will, you will, it, it will be, it will be within that vicinity, you are, I mean, you, you will be, you, you can't be harassed easily. Once you have the, when the next DPO come, do the same thing, offer them free medical services. All you need is very, free medical service is very small. You know, um, let people like us, we just get uh, flabbergasted when you hold out your stethoscope and you just check something, even if nothing is doing. <laughs> we actually, we, I'm serious, we totally believe that, look, a lot of service is going on. When you, especially when you wear your coat and then wear that stethoscope, just, I mean, just go ahead and, and do that, you know, blood checks, this, that, and, and all that. Um, that that's, that's, that's practical wisdom for the doctor and the um, hospital administrator to ensure that he follows. So I believe that the police in, in Lekki, you know, they, they had a rapport with the hospital. So they, they did that. So the court gave that order. The order reads like um, directed to Chevron Hospital that you must do everything within your power, medically fit, reasonable, and this to ensure that the child is alive. So when they did that, the parents went to court to vacate that. It is that order that went to the Supreme Court. Yes. Yes, not the action. I think the, the, the entire sect were trying to fight. Not, it was not just a, the child's issue. They were trying to fight a system, a principle. Yes. They were trying to fight a principle. Unfortunately, us, or rather fortunately for us all, um, Justice Body wrote Vivo when delivering that um, judgment. That's the first case that the Supreme Court had um, an opportunity to differentiate between Dr. Okonko's case and um, when, if the person is a child. So the Supreme Court went into the whole um, issue of consent and said, okay, fine. Before you make any invasive or whatever operation it is in an adult, you need to get his consent. What if it is a child? And like um, Dr. Eseko, you know, I don't know if to call him doctor now or barrister doctor, but you know, you've done so, you've appraised it so uh, beautifully. Um, the Supreme Court basically said, well, the person who is in locus parentis does not have the right to deny a child the right to be. And so when the person who is in local parentis is taking a decision that um, undermines the life of a child, the doctor can override it. Doctor can override it. And that's very that's that's proof that's profound. Yes. That's not the case if it's an adult. Uh, if it's a wife that is in 
danger, the husband, and, and I mean, that's not the case. Everything stated in Dr. Okunku's case is, um, is, is, is stands. But let me go back to Dr. Okunku's case. So you didn't ask, so what did, what did the tribunal say? What did the tribunal say? So let's let's go through the trajectory of. First of all, the, the, it raises it raises the medical issue of ethical dilemma. Anyhow, you look at it, the doctor is is um, is an it, it raises what you call ethical dilemma. An ethical dilemma is a scenario where heads you lose, tail you lose. So it puts you in a it puts you in a tight corner. And the way the tribunal put it is this. Let me put it, let me put it this, this, this way. When, when a practitioner is faced with a dilemma arising from the refusal to grant informed consent, what do you do? What do you do? There are two options. They prescribed. You know, the medical um, engaging a, a patient is a medical contract. So now the patient walks into your office, there is a contract. And like all contracts, it can be terminated. So um, the tribunal believes that you have two options. Number one, terminate the contract. Or, that's very theoretical, I think they were not thinking. Terminate the contract or refer him or her to another doctor like Dr. Okafor did. As a matter of fact, when you refer, it's both ways. You both terminated the contract and you've pushed the person to another place. But, Talking practically, can we look at scenarios in which none of this is feasible? You've referred, the guy says he's not going. Or he's in such a dire state. Okay, or thank you, uh, or doctor strike. Is there any other scenario we can look at? I don't know if there's anybody who's faced this medical dilemma and wants to basically just throw some, some light. And what did you do? Yes, ma'am. Please, ma'am. I once had a patient who needed special baby care and we were renovating our office. So we, I consulted with another consultant in the National Hospital, no, uh, a so called hospital. We discussed what the case is and everything, and I wanted feedback. But by the time they went there, the bed that was available had so they called me and told me, and the consultant cannot tell them to tell the patient that was on their bed. So they called me. We, start, we tried another hospital again, the same story. This one was Baba Zalema. The same story. To cut the story short, the, the patient went from Baba Zalema to National Hospital for seeking medical. And we just had to sit down the parents. This is the scenario we have. This child is premature. We need to put this child in. You know, special baby care unit, but you can see that this, uh, we cannot put her here. So, what do we do? They say, Doctor, I need to you think you can do to help in the time. They say, Okay, so you sign. And that's what we did. We had to nurse the baby along with the mother that was in the cycle. Okay. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you. You, 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 okay, how about putting it together with a rule of um, one of the rules of medical ethics that says the primary responsibility of a doctor is to save his patients. Sorry, <laughs> oh, and his own life. <laughs> no, his own skin. <laughs> Because that's 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 uh, as a matter of fact, it's it's um it's in the oath that you take. 
That's why it's a dilemma. That um, even if you are going to refer a patient, you need to ensure that he is able to get to the referral hospital. That's part of your that's part of your responsibility and and duty. So the the tribunal actually believed that because he was a Jehovah's Witness, Doctor Koko himself was Jehovah's Witness. So there was that there was that aspect, there was that suspicion in their minds mm -hmm. that the reason why he did that was that he allowed his religious belief to override his professional judgment. And that was a major um, argument that was canvassed at the, at the tribunal. And the tribunal actually convicted him and um, directed the registrar to strike his name off the register. So, so he went to he went to the court of appeal. The court of appeal said no, it's an assumption. Um, sorry, the court of appeal endorsed the tribunal. No, sorry, the court of appeal, um, the the court of appeal set him free, exonerated him, and said it's a conjecture. Is an assumption. What do you really want him to do? And um, of course, in courts, there is a lot of loopholes you can always navigate around. You know, very much why they say lawyers are bad. Um, everything is not just black and white. And the Supreme Court went into um, the counsel appealed to the Supreme Court. And um, the Supreme Court didn't agree with the tribunal. They endorsed the position of the Court of Appeal and said, um, well, taking a look at medical ethics, the doctor was in a dilemma. And the much as it's important to interpret the medical ethics in a way that protects. So actually the entire policy around the medical ethics is, is not the protection of the doctor. It is the protection of the public and the way the public views the medical protection, uh, I mean, the, prof the profession. They say you can't, um, you can't prove that he did not act in his best interests, in the interest of his Patient. In in view of the um, the weight that the law puts on the consent of the individual, because there was a note that was given to him, signed by her when she arrived at the hospital. She was not unconscious. She was still conscious. They took her from Onisha to Enu. She was conscious, so she signed that she does not want blood and she is prepared to abide by the consequences of her decisions. Her husband signed a similar note. The Jehovah Witness people have a, a written um, template. And so the, the, the Supreme Court said in, that was an exercise of the fundamental right of an adult. And there is nothing that showed that she was actually asked, you know, in her, either she was insane or she didn't understand precisely what, what it is. That you don't have the, a doctor does not have the power to save a man who does not want to live. So based on those, um, and then some evidential issues, they were, um, Dr. Okonko was, Set for. So that's 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 so it raises the issue of understanding the importance of consent in medical um, procedure. Because a number of times 
we just look at the some of those forms and I don't know, you know, some of those pro forms, those protocols, those procedures, and we don't understand it. Understanding is a wellspring of life to those who have it. If you don't have understanding, it's very. I I I once had a I once had a situation where I was taking compensation for, for um for that's the easiest way for a lawyer to actually lose a certificate. Your a compensation money is being paid into your account. Now um, it's nice when you handle certain cases to anticipate trouble. And so this is what I did. And I want to also recommend this for every doctor. Apart from what you write, I have a, please don't suspect me. I have a pen. It just looks like a pen or is a recorder. It records. Uh, you wouldn't know I'm recording it. I don't use it always. But there are situations and issues that I just, you just have to be on your guard. This is money paid to dead people. The people who are collect, I mean, respect of dead people, the people are collecting the money. You don't, you are not hundred percent sure what may happen. So I am documenting for a 10, 20 year future. So that if anybody comes tomorrow and say, no, who gave you the authority? Oh, this is the process, this is the process. But you hardly can be in that. So sometimes when we take those procedures, the hospital procedures for surgery, for different kinds of procedures, I think the surgeon and the hospital people should be taking through, and I think, you know, I'm sure Lini Hospital and a number of them, they do this, understand what they entail. They are not just, they are not just words for what sake. Just take out time to take a look at it again and again. And I'm sure we will um, we'll be better off than that. Um, Dr. Sek, when are we going for lunch? We do lunch or take the next case. Yes, I think we, is there any on this? Because I want us to, yeah, what's yours? Okay. Okay, fine. Case, but case, so let's do case three. Can we have the slide for case three? We have, we have it. At least the please go ahead, sir. What was was the remind? I made a number of recommendations. Sir. I don't know that. I honestly don't know that law. The law I know. The law I know is that once, once the it's not something you publish. Once um, there is a fact in issue, I give you um, Otis case for example. The issue was basically an issue of proving if I consented to the procedure you went through. And a hundred, I mean, a hundred million was was at stake. In your own case, your certificate, your life, your career, your fifteen years, it's at stake. Let me add one case um, to the blood. This particular blood issue. This happened in Metama. Um, Milam, Doctor Milam, and um, Doctor Milam and Doctor Amos, consultant gynecologist in um, Metama General Hospital, ran into trouble. His own, um, thank you so much, his own sin or his own um, ethical issue, same Jehovah Witness um, scenario. She was pregnant. Um, the child was delivered safely. The child was delivered safely and then um, she began to bleed. The next day, about 24 hours after they did a CS, 24 hours after CS, the child, I mean, she began to bleed. 
and um, the doctors prescribed that they get O short half, um, O blood group or something, and left. There were two doctors in. Um, there were two doctors involved. I think I have it somewhere here. There were two doctors involved, and um, the consultant was supposed to be there personally, but he allowed junior doctors to do the to do the surgery. Unfortunately, she died. So um, petitions were written against the three doctors. The three doctors were <laughs> the three doctors were in trouble. The question in that case was not just the focus of the investigation was not just again now that they refused um, blood transfusion. Um, the issue for the consultant was why did you allow your yes the presentations she had she had all the factors showed a very high risk patient she was obese her blood pressure was up um she's had previous complications all the parameters for red alert was the cause of it based on the medical records brought the medical records then that it for the treatment so of course the, the tribunal convicted the the doctor based on the fact that knowing that these presentations exist you should have handled the surgery personally you should have handled so the, the that particular case was a little bit different yes they all the three of them had to do with Refusal um, for consent, refusing um, medical pres prescription, but it was a little bit different in the sense that okay, there was negligence, um, in, and the fact that the doctor was not there. One of the parts of the rules is that you ought to be there to attend to your patients as and at when due. Yes. Okay, so let's let's look at this particular case together. Um, history three. Sorry, why is it what? I didn't hear that, doctor. Oh, and there are lots. I don't know why. Now, just just the thought of it. Olo's case is guiding me again. <laughs> a lot of a lot of guiding issues. A lot. I never thought of it, but a lot. A lot. Yes, this one is also coming from Enugu. I don't know, doctor. I don't have answer to that question. <laughs> I don't have answer to that question. Okay, so this is Dr. Obioma Okeze and Chairman Medical and Dental Practitioner Disciplinary Tribunal. So let's, let's, let's look at the case together. Online participants, ha, I hope you're still there. Um, Dr. Obioma Okeze is a consultant of obstetricians and gynecologists and a lecturer at UNTH Enugu. He owned and operated Christian Miracle Hospital. He owned and operated Christian Miracle Hospital at Enugu. It was neither registered by law as at that time. Please, <laughs> I'm sure it's now registered. Or with the registering authorities. Sometime in September 1998, Dr. Okeze successfully carried out five blood surgery on Mrs. Omiro Bikwe, deceased, with the consent of her husband, Dr. Ifani. Obekwe, also a medical doctor. Before the surgery, the patient had complained of infertility and miscarriage and had a malmectomy in England in 1996. Sorry, what was that again? I checked it. Fibroid removal. Okay. Um, two years after the surgery, 
she became pregnant and approached Dr. Okeze in his private clinic to be her doctor for the purpose of antenatal care. During the antenatal care, after examination, the doctor concluded that the patient could only deliver the baby through cesarean operation. And this was fixed for a given date. The operation commenced at 12 11 noon on the day in question with the husband of the deceased in attendance. Dr. Obiekwe photographed the proceedings during the surgery. The operation was completed at about 1.45 p.m. and the patient was moved to the ward. However, at 4.20, the condition of the disease suddenly changed for the worse. The doctor who was recalled from his house within the same vicinity where he went to have his lunch, in turn called Dr. Obekwe, the husband of the deceased, to report immediately with all that he had for the resuscitation of the life of his wife. He didn't succeed, she died. Dr. Okeze set in motion measures to save the life of the deceased by introducing blood transfusion and other measures to no avail. By 8 p.m., he pronounced the deceased dead. Dr. Obekwe, the deceased husband, asked for autopsy to be performed on the deceased, and this was done accordingly. However, the deceased mother and brother suspected foul play. In spite of the fact that the husband was there, right in the operation theater. Um, however, the deceased mother and brother suspected foul play in the death of the deceased and therefore filed a complaint at the medical and dental practitioner's disciplinary tribunal. After, after, after investigations, Dr. Okeze was arraigned before the tribunal. The tribunal, after full trial, found him guilty and suspended um, him from practice for six months. Now, it's important that we look at the charge. I think that will bring out the, 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 the real issue because it looks confusing. What did he do wrong, right? So this is the charge at the tribunal. That you, Dr. Obioma Azubike Okeze, and this is how it is usually. Yeah, this, when a charge is framed um, in the tribunal, it mentions specifically, it's supposed to mention specifically what you did and the part of the medical code that you infracted or violated. So this goes like this. Now you, Obioma Azubike, okay, is a registered special obstetrician and gynecologist engaged as such at an unregistered institution. Known as Christian Miracle Hospital, 11B, John Modo, close, GRA Nugu, was negligent in the manner you attended to one Mrs. Mwiru Obiekwe on, on or about 23rd February 2001. In that, before, during, and after the obstetric operation of cesarean section, which you performed on the same Umbiro where you failed to secure the professional services of an anesthetist and also of qualified registered nurses to provide necessary professional care as required during the period for the patient. Um, can we begin complete this? So let me just read this from. So from what we can see here, there are two issues that I need us to just throw um, out before I look at the, while I look, can we look at it, think through it and discuss it while I look at the third element of complaint. Anybody want to um, discuss the issues? Anybody want to discuss the issues? What would they be doing? Yes, I think that's the first thing that comes to light. The fact that this hospital is not registered. 
GOD. So that can be by, that can be uh, against him, even though he is a specialist theology um, doctor. So that's the first thing that's very clear. Regarding the second one, I don't know. Question of that. Okay. <clears throat> Anybody else? Anybody else? In Nigeria, there is no anesthetic for every operation. Does every operation have an anesthetist? The answer is no. They were getting the only notes to look at it. The process of registration usually takes long in Nigeria by experience. And even for a hospital. And some hospitals are allowed to start provided you have tenders with evidence of registration. So you might not have the approval handy. Assuming he is in transition of that, can the law take a bite of him in that regard? No, yes or no. If you started the process of registration and the registration is not complete, you are not supposed to start. So for example, if you go for a driver's license and you are processing your driver's license, they give you a paper that says provisional something. If you had that, why not? Now, one of the first things that happens with the MDC, the first thing, when they bring any case, is that they check your license. It's your license of business. Mm -hmm. two, if you are a specialist, have you registered yourself as a specialist with MDC? And is it up to date? If you have not done it, you are already guilty. Let, Just, me, let me add another one, doctor. If you've not paid your practicing fees. Yes, if you can, that's the license, the first one. Your okay, that's the license. Okay, uh, fine. If your license is not updated, okay. you are guilty fair. That means you are practicing as an authorized agent. A, a, a just came as, a, as a matter of fact, it is a crime. Yeah. So if your licensing fee is not to date, if you are a specialist and you are not registered as a specialist with MDC and it comes with the certificates, if you don't have that, you are really guilty. Number three, and it did not say in this case, I probably see other part. If you are working with a government facility and working in a private facility, you're already guilty. And as a major doctor in town, I read the, the, the case. Among those cases I talked about recently, those were the first things that they used to best deal in. He, he resigned from the government hospital, the big hospital in town, I don't call it. He resigned from the government hospital, all right, during the case. But as at the time of the case, it was employed both in the government hospital and in the private hospital. So those first things will be the first, you know, basic, you know, when, when they catch you for not to pay food bills, then they check the basic, do you have license, do you have triangle, do you, do you have those ones? Before we start talking about the other one. So by that first one, it's very clear. Now, I would argue, or when lawyer, I will argue that MDCM does not, by the law that formed them, does not regulate hospitals. They regulate practice of professionals and practice of medicine, not hospitals. And that it is the state's hospital boards that registers hospitals. If I am a mass lawyer. The next thing that will go on to prove if I'm a mass lawyer, because I'm barrister doctor, man, he has been doing barrister. <laughs> That the hospital, even though unregistered, met all the criteria to be registered. And so it was not, I did not take the person to my follow up and start doing surgery. That will be the next thing. You may not win, but I'm telling you how I will argue if I were in the case. The third thing I will not go to argue is that I will go to argue on the basis of prescription of service of anesthetics. And how to argue on this one is a difficult one. I don't, think, I don't think it's possible, but I think it's a difficult one. The only way to argue is to say that this was an uncomplicated case, of which it is not. There are several issues intertwined, had previous surgery, fertility, so many issues, which warranted the need of anesthetic. Now, that being said, if your anesthetic was not there, you must have at least an anesthetic nurse on staff. That was not there. And it seems as if some of the nurses were not registered. Again, are all your nurses in the facility, do they have valid nurses licenses for that year? 
So if any of them that have not paid their licenses whatsoever, it can be said you were doing things with unregistered things. Do we see all the issues? Now, it seems as if this guy preempted problem by taking pictures. It's like he knew something was going to go wrong. According to the, I think you said they were- It was the husband that was taking that picture. Oh, the husband, not the doctor. Not the doctor. Oh. Let me give you the third and four. Okay, sorry, ma. Yes, go, go ahead, ma. I think from the beginning, like you mentioned, the government private work, and he was working within the hours he should supposed to be in his own government yeah. working place. Yeah. Then um, we don't know whether he had anything activated concerning all activities in the private clinic. And why should he involve the deceased host husband in uh, sourcing for resuscitation? We are not supposed as patient to really be involved Very in the treatment of the yeah. patient. Yeah. And uh, between 4.20 uh, p.m. to 8 p.m., there was nothing really said about what was the mechanism that was activated to save this patient's life. So, yeah. Aside from the other things that you mentioned, these are things I mentioned. Okay. She and was again, a single man. <laughs> Just like I said at the beginning. He was single. Let me, let me read the third um, issue. In the preoperative, intraoperative and post-operative management of the said Mrs. Ogikwe. You ignore the high-risk factors in the said patient, who being an elderly primigravida, primigravida, with a history of a previous abdominal scan, scan from myomectomy, low lying placenta and transverse lie of fetus by not providing intraoperative and postoperative care for her in an institution with requisite facilities. You see the you see where the licensing of the of the facility no, what they are saying is that they don't. So, what, what, what has happened here is that, look, the complications that developed, you don't have the facility to handle a case like this. So the registration, it wasn't, the, 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 the lack of registration was not isolated from the complications and the facilities that is required to manage that kind of patient. And the, um, the high risk factors were already there, which are mentioned with this big medical grammar. How many, how many, Sorry, sir. <laughs> how many hospitals do have all the facilities to take on the complications that happen to the That's not a problem. Until, until, they have, until, until they have yes. <laughs> <laughs> then it now becomes it now becomes a it now becomes a problem. You know, even the uh, anesthesia, anesthesia. Yeah. So I'm sure he must have done a number of you know cases like that without the need for. After all, is it not just uh, just know some drugs and give him drugs to, to give give the patient. So those are those are the risky things that it's it's important to understand the implications of every procedure that the medical practitioner undertakes. You know, um, insurance. The principle of insurance is basically the management of risks. And if you don't understand risk, if you don't, if you can't even label risk, then you can't manage it. And that's, that's, that's important, I believe, for the medical practitioner. To understand his environment, to understand his patient, to read the risk, but in proper context. And look, if the, which is why there is a medical insurance that is prescribed. And in, in the, um, abroad, these things are taken, um, I think, more serious than um, over here. Because a number of the cases, if they had medical insurance, eh, let the insurance take care of it. Some of a lot of doctors who even have 
the professional medical insurance. When they get into trouble, they don't even call on the insurance because the insurance contract also states that if I am sued while performing my duties and my profession within the time of this insurance, then you are going to be responsible for what I am liable with, even where I'm negligent. The only thing they can't be responsible for is um, if my if my name is struck on the rules or the yeah. But a number of the litigations that uh, medical hospitals and doctors face, they still lie in the realm of um, few in MDCN. That's the truth. The truth is that we are still facing a largely illiterate population. That's the truth. We are still facing a largely illiterate population. Just imagine the number of doctors who are practicing in the villages, who are practicing in the rural areas. They get away with a lot of things. They don't use any of those things. They, I mean, they usually, I mean, they don't do any of those things. But the doctors are scarce. I mean, they are rare. In my village, there is no doctor. As in my village, there is not a single doctor. Not one. And we have at least, it's a, we have a population of at least 10,000 people. Not a single doctor. For you to get to, for you to get to um, the nearest doctor is like 25 to 30 kilometers away. By then, it's an emergency. And there are many, many rural areas. I travel in rural areas um, that, that, that don't have hospitals. So the populace, uh, but if you are practicing in a metropolitan city like Abuja, you are, you are at high risk. That's the honest truth. It's completely a different bowl of tea, cup of tea than practicing in Boko or in uh, Malumfashi, or in somewhere in one village in Bios, it's different. This is the federal, the, the richest elites live in Abuja. So your, 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 your exposure to risk is higher. The most connected people live where you are practicing. So if you are in the metropolis, you can't afford to just practice like the man who is in Dekina. I'm sorry if you are from Dekina somewhere. I don't even know where it is. Kogi State or Niger State. Uh, Kogi State. And that's my state. So, <laughs> so that's, that's me. So the fourth one, the fourth one is at the time of, at the time of the operation, an immediate post-operative period, you fail to provide cross-matched blood and oxygen, which will have been used to resuscitate the patient at the time of impending respiratory failure, which eventually set in post-operatively, in the immediate post-operative period, where there was no qualified professional nurse or medical practitioner to monitor the vital signs and provide care even whilst the patient was still unconscious. And in the alternative, you fail to make yourself available to provide requisite post-operative care, including monitoring of the respiration, cardiovascular action, and level of consciousness to the unconscious patient. So we need to identify, the, we, need to, we need to unpack this. One, there was no cross-matched blood and oxygen that would have been used to resuscitate the patient. How many healthcare systems also, Dr. Seko, you want to say, have those? Because these are like basically are investigators. Have it, yes, but do they have it at the time that it is needed? Question. Um, now, before I say, I will come to you. What I will say is that if we waited for every facility to have everything needed, Every surgery, we will have a lot of problems. In the rural place that I did, 
rural posting. Go from Daya Hospital, I think, in Zaria. The surgeries were not done by doctors, they were done by theatre nurses. By they permitted. What about permission there? <laughs> <laughs> If you go there, you will learn how to do CS in 15 20 minutes. Wow, you will learn the most effective, efficient, without much of uh, this thing. And they kind of just move the baba with that one side there and just uh, start. I'm telling you, yes, those are trained there by these people, and the patients are doing well. Now, now they may like they may have a Setting higher above threshold number of uh, complications and mortality. But for the vast majority of people, if those who do not have them, they will, they will die. Mm. There are places in Benue too where it is only nurses and Jews that are doing everything. Mm. So if you take all these things, so most of the MDCN guys, like MDCN tribunals, do not just base their decisions on whether or not you did the right thing or not. They asked that, asked a colleague of similar training that if you were in the situation he was in, would you have acted in that way? So if I am in that area and there is nothing else, would I have yes, the woman came in, did something, she could not move anywhere, there was no way to move to the next city was 40 kilometers or one hour. I had an emergency. I have done it severally before. I've done over 200 cases and there have been no problem. Will I not risk carrying this one to 60 kilometers to go and, and die on the way? And you did it. So, any other reasonable professional that is of your level of training, not they will not get a gynecologist to ask for a medical officer. They will ask a medical officer if you were in this death situation, what would you do? If all of them are answering the affirmative, what if it was you could have done? And you did it. In most cases, the medical tribunal will not find you. But if you are a professional in Abuja, there were places around you. Three people will say, my friend, this team is beyond me. I will have referred. I will have referred. Then you are now free. So those context is also very important. Yeah. yeah. Everything. I'm really happy they found him guilty or liable because, I mean, he was completely He's an obstetric gynecologist. He's in a teaching hospital, so he should have known better. You have low lying placenta, you have transverse like there must be bleeding. Then you don't even have anybody to monitor the patient after. I mean, it's so negligent. I'm so happy he was. Honestly, he's practicing, he's like a butcher shop. I mean, he's just okay, like quick fix, make quick box. Because if you look at the context, that his clinic is just for quick money. Honestly, he was completely negligent. I mean, he's even lucky he only got six months. Because, I mean, look at the race. That patient, low lying placenta, even before or during labor, they would have been bleeding. Then transverse lie again. And then you don't even prepare. You don't have blood. You don't have anesthetist. You don't have anyone to monitor. I'm fine. Let me, give you a <laughs> <laughs> Let me also give you a retract about to her. Assuming the same person did this surgery in a teaching hospital and have the same outcome, would they still have charged him? He's a consultant gynecologist and he should have been prepared. The risks are there. In a teaching hospital, the setting would have been different. The issue of not having backup nurses would not have There would have been someone monitoring. It's likely he would have done it in the same manner he did. But the issue about not having enough facility would not have come up. The backup nurses and the care would not have been there. And in addition to all of that, what I want to say is if you find yourself practicing in a small clinic, you have to now practice defensive medicine, especially when there is access to referral center. I think it's something to consider. You find yourself practicing in a place where you are the only one. You now have to, I think I have a friend who runs a, a gynae hospital. 
And she says, whenever they bring any case, and it's, it's two or three matters, please take this one to me, because she's the only one there. And when this MCM comes upon you, especially if you're a one-man clinic, the law is different. Okay, so people, they are different. I like that you... phrase, defensive medicine. Yes. <laughs> I wish you can explain, because that, that sounds medical legal yes. to me, you know. I okay. hope that defensive medicine will not kill a patient anyway. Okay, so that's the problem now. So yes. I, I work in a hospital, in a city hospital, and I can tell you that blood is not always available. One, oxygen is not always available. A lot of times, plenty. There are patients that have died because there was no blood, no oxygen, no ventilator. But there was a time when there was one ventilator for three patients. This person is a professor, we move it to the higher person. True story. And so is eh? I'm just saying that if the same lack of facilities happen in the tertiary hospital, it may not have been as frowned at because and I'm telling you that several there's no oxygen in life. Eh, something, something. Let us go and look for oxygen. Patient go and buy blood. We go to the next place to go and buy blood. The patient comes back to buy blood. Mark, I don't think it's always that the hospital always has. Patient goes to go and buy blood outside. Bring the blood back inside. That was a, those are standards. Even the elective. Ah. I'm telling you, brain surgery patient has gone to buy the water they used to wash their hands. Yes. Yes, a new stunt type of brain, elective. Hmm. In this country, there is not a. The only difference is that sometimes you need to understand that um, there's no it's not like it's independent. This is a body that is a function of an organ of government. This and that one is an organ of government. Now, if those things happen, you also believe that, okay, so what else could have happened? In a case where a patient dies in the teaching hospital and should have been fed because the situation was not happening, and some other person had the facility that was not working, teaching hospitals are not, not referred. Even when you don't have the facility, what happens? But if you attack that, you attack the system, and nobody ever wins against the system. So, what we will just take, one of the things we will take from this is number one, hiring setup. High risk behavior. And um, one of the reasons why teachers will not be indicted is that high risk behavior is less likely. Yeah. There will have been more doctors, there will have been more people, there will have more ability to make blood available in a short time, in a shorter time. Um, what again? It is typically standard for pay, pay patients to donate blood before doing that, that are standard. Those standards may not have been upheld in this place. So those are the things that I think um, you know that he may have got you wrong besides. So yes. Uh, sorry, you, you 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 want to give you want to give <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. And if I tell you the if I that I'm not scared of telling Dr. Amadi, right? Yeah. I, the, I, I'm scared of telling Dr. Amadi the conclusion of this. <laughs> so so let me read let me read what the MDCM said that's the tribunal said the, the, the tribunal said the, op the operative record shows that the doctor not only removed the baby and the placenta and he said he was on the lower segment of the uterus he also removed a fibroid that was on the same lower segment this was highly dangerous and irresponsible thing to do. It might have contributed to the heavy bleeding seen by the patient's mother that led to the patient's death. So you 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 really spoke like a tribunal. When you're made the doctor, the doctor will not be but the fibroid was not on its way. Um, 
You see here? No, it was not along the line. And it was in the lower segment. It was not along the line, number one. And it was in the lower segment, number two. Cesarean myomectomy is generally frowned against. And the idea is that it might be the, the myoma in this during the pregnancy period have a less differentiation margin from the from the first world. So to educate them is even typically harder. Now, yes, you can say you are a skin specialist, you have done several times before, but when things go wrong, I was telling you, even when people cure and they have a cure, it's not it's one case. The fact that everybody makes sure that blood will be available, we don't do that mentally, we don't do that. It's only in that one case that the patient, the specialist or the professional from the artisan. And in that one case is where he has failed, in, in my opinion. And maybe that is why he found that. So maybe he has not been able to it. What you are saying may be right. Anytime you breach a guideline, general guideline, all of us know this is the guideline. You must make sure, number one, you have another specialist that backs you up in that thing you are doing. That is, you have to tell that agree in surgery that the only way out is to take care of this. Number three, you must not breach any other guideline. You cannot do that in any setting that could be compromised. No ICU, no blood, no this, no that. You cannot finish and go and have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot do that. So if you have reached a guideline, and I always say anytime I want to be guideline, I will call my colleague Dr. Alex Soye, what do you think? Yes. And I, I will write, see you, Dr. Alex Soye. Yes. <laughs> I tell you. And Dr. Alex Soye will write, see you, Dr. Iseko. So that whenever I see you, what our are you You understand? So by the time you want to reach a guideline, the typical rule is that two specialists must agree. Then it now becomes a guide itself because it now becomes expert opinion, not just your own. So in that regard, those things you did were considered risky behavior. When you are looking at medical um, errors, and we talked about the time the other day, medical errors, the things that are supposed to be punished are risky behavior. That is, you do things knowing fully well that there could be repercussions, and you ignore the guidelines not the best. That is risky behavior. Even if you get away with it, you still be punished. Even in our normal practice. Oh, even if you get away with it. No, internally. Okay, no, okay. No, no, okay. No, no, internally. If you still be punished, you engage in risky behavior. This behavior will get us in trouble. So you could have gotten away with it, but this behavior is risky behavior. And those are things that you should consider. Yes, sir. That was the uh, junior residency. I think that was very. <laughs> ambitious. I am no longer that ambitious. <laughs> so, but I was collecting data for my dissertation on the Saturday, and some junior registrar said, Please do echo for this child. Obviously, in AKTH1 and 3, you must make your diagnosis on one unit before you send. So, chest x ray was showing dilated um, cardiac shadow, and the first was dilated cardiomyopathy. So I went to just confirm a DCM for us to send to the cardiology, and it was it was pulse, that is pericardial effusion. The child was in tampon. Now, all the signs, pent triad was positive, veins, everything. The child was almost giving up. This was at about four o'clock. Now, the cardiothoracic surgeons will leave hospital by nine. I did my echo and I left. I said, Call the cardiothoracic surgeon. My question is about risky behavior. I'm no longer risky. <laughs> okay, so call the cardiothoracic surgeons to drain this. By 9 p.m., the cardiothoracic surgeons had gone and the child was deteriorating further. Now, because I was very ambitious, one of the junior teachers said, Dr. Peter, you are trained to be a cardiologist, save the life of this child. So I called the consultant in that field. This is the situation. This child will very likely die before morning. I have never done pericardial synthesis before. As a matter of fact, I've never watched it done. But this is the situation I find myself. What can I will not go ahead without your permission? I said, whatever you can do, do. 
Now, um, I started watching YouTube videos immediately. <laughs> Sorry, I started watching YouTube videos immediately. I arranged everything, informed the mother. I was very ambitious then, informed the mother, but luckily got senior registrants from adult medicine mm -hmm. who have done pericardial synthesis in the echo room. So it was under echo guidance. I had not done before. They guided me. We got in like two point five times of pause. The child survived it. Now, it was a procedure that my, I had two professors, one trained in India, one in Malaysia. The history has been that they will move stuff, give to survive the child will die. So they were not even aware I did what I did. But I think I got the guidance of at internal medicine people who had done. It was successful. The fact was that by the time I finished, I had done more than 11, 12, and all that. And they wanted me to teach other people. But it took something to take that step. It was risky. Um, I don't know. Is that, it qualifies for risky behavior. I am afraid of doing that now. Um, but what would have happened? I told the consultant that this child could die on the table with me, or the child would die before morning. So I don't know. If somebody is to do that, I won't do that to you. But I'll be sorry, please help us. That's why we get to have care. Thank you very much for, for that scenario you just discussed now. I think, like Dr. Seko said earlier on, everything is context, context, context. And um, if you had cardiothoracic surgeons available, let's say it was on the day, maybe the child was not that poorly that was sitting at the as though she was going to die. And you did that. That would have been reckless because you had other options. Now we are going to be safe. I know it's for me. So, so that would have been that would have been totally inappropriate and should be punished. At least you had other people that do it, you can have other options that were safer. But in this case, if you actually left the child to your money because they have no design, the child will have died. Based on your own judgment, I think the best thing to do, and everybody should will likely see it that way. But again, it depends on availability. Now, there are other things that, that can make that situation more complex in the political dynamics of a teaching hospital. Now, there can be situations too that are supposed to be on call, but that they went to. So if you look at the political dynamics and it doesn't feel well, like, so who will deny you the next day? It's better to hands up, okay? But you have to also to be scenario. Well, and what well, that's true, but you have to look at that politics. But some people also argue that you should not see that kind of echo and go on, whether you're on duty or not. That's the truth. Some people tell you that you cannot see Pampona and Echo, and you know that this child is going to die, that you do everything possible to get all the help the person needs for you, for you. So those are the things that are put in the mix, but I think it's context dependent, and there are things you do. So let's say I have the confidence to put to drain cardiac or whatever blood in the chest. But let's say, I mean, somewhere where there are serious people, I should leave them to do it. But if I see an accident victim at 1 a.m. and the guy is almost bleeding out, trying almost dying. And I didn't do it. If I don't do it, I will try. I, I should give them the chance to. So those are the contexts that everybody's going to look at. And I think the first of us address some of those areas. Thank, Thank you. Sorry, I made a mistake. There is risky behavior, there's reckless behavior. Uh -huh. Risky behavior is, is where you are doing what you did is risky. Reckless behavior, you know there are options and you still took on those things despite that. And you ignored all the options all the warning signs, everything, reckless behavior. And you know, the important thing about reckless behavior is that because it's very high adrenaline, when you succeed in reckless behavior, you yeah, give you more warning. You, you, you want to do another one. And another one, you come in you <laughs> Until the one that will take your death. So anytime you are in hospital management practice, you are, practice, you are managing a hospital, you should look out for reckless behavior. And punish it severely. When you find risky behavior, you can coach. When you find a mistake, never punish. You should, you should educate, find an issue. But once you find reckless behavior, you should take the most because it will eventually prosper. You see about reckless behavior, when you pull it off, everybody calls for you. But we know from studies that hospitals that have heroes never do as well. As of the hard protocol. The protocol based hospitals always, there's a full study on it, 
the don't retrieve live DNA at all in the US. Always I'll perform hospitals with stars. Those people that they have the biggest stars, the best surgeons, their numbers are always worse than the people that just work with protocol in this case, which is this. I would argue in that case that they are CTS, they are CTS, CTS surgeons on call. I would also argue that your consultant is on call and your consultant is liable, and that your consultant should have been there. It's paid a call duty and it should have been there. And there's no reason why it should leave you learning on YouTube to do that kind of thing. I would argue that that consultant is executing reckless behavior and you risky behavior, which was needed based on context. You know that you don't take this risk to tell you that. And if you follow all the protocol, whatever this tells you that. But that person that was over you, that said, do whatever you want, and went back to sleep. That is a reckless behavior in the highest Okay, when it's time for lunch, it's been an engaging, uh, been an engaging um, session. We'll just do lunch and come back. But let me give you bad the bad news on this case to round off. <laughs> the good news. The court um, overruled the tribunal. Number one, just like Dr. Eseko speculated, he paid 1,600 Naira, which is like application fee for registration. <laughs> so he tendered it. He said, well, I don't have approval. It's not registered. It's not a registrar. It's not a registered medical institution. But the registration does not lie on me. It lies on the ministry of health. They told me to collect the form. I collected the form, paid 1,600. They said they were going to come. They, they never came. And they never came. Take, they tendered it in evidence. Take, take a look at it. So the, the tribunal did not even look at all that nonsense. They called it nonsense. But the court said, well, you are the prosecution. You are the prosecutor. It was your duty. The, the burden is on you to refute that allegation, and you did it. And where there is a doubt where somebody's medical career is in, in, in question or in crime, like I said, it's a quasi criminal proceeding. The doubt is often always is a, is a policy of criminal um, justice system. You resolve doubts in favor of the person. And secondly, on all those no anesthesia, no high risk, musical, oxygen. Well, they said it was speculative. And the law does not work on speculation. That it was your, you know, the way the tribunal works is almost like a parent and a child. You know, they are, exactly. They are, you know, um, you have uh, Daniel, Dotu, you know, Abaka, you know, and all that. Say, who did this? You, 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 you did it. What's wrong with you? Now, go and face the wall. And then you are both the accuser, you are the judge, you are the everything. Even when he's presenting, as they, I know, even when he's pre presenting evidence, you, you've already made up your mind before he finishes his evidence. So some, some way, the, the, the professional disciplinary tribunals are often, yes, doctor. Yes, but it will have it to be that it be, that, the, yes, it should be it should be against you. So there was a case like that, one of my friends, Malu Fashi, and he, he met members of the tribunal after they said, look, the political pressure was high. So we had to do something. So they gave him three months, short enough that before he does any appeal, it will be over. I told that she does not worry. I felt otherwise. I, I mean, he felt okay, maybe. But if you are somebody that is going far, let's say you want to go and come in a president or a governor before, somebody will bring you out somewhere. So if your name is important sometimes, if you truly are sure, you may need to go all the way to make sure that you squash it. So that will be the reputation to be that, no, I was not convicted. So even though somebody says later, I have your convicted, bring this out and say it was overturned. It was not properly done. So that is it. You have lost six months 
No doubt. You have lost one year. No doubt. But if you are truly innocent, then you should have the benefit of doubt. And everybody is innocent until proven uh, guilty otherwise. Okay. Um, we have some en engaging um, questions um, online. Dr. Olali Kong, I think I've answered this question. Okay. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of um, Okonko um, respecting the patient's written order. Of course, I've answered that. Yes, that's that's correct. Um, that's the correct position. The Supreme Court um, respected her written consent as as it were. Yes, thank you so much uh, for our online um, participants, about 21 of them participating online. And um, we are we're sorry we, you couldn't get involved in the nitty gritty of it. For example, you couldn't see the anger of Dr. <laughs> <laughs> on, on her face when she was crucifying Dr. Kezeda. His shop is a medical, is a butcher's <laughs> shop. She described it as a butcher's shop. I can I can imagine the rage as, as it is. But it's, it's interesting. I want to thank you. Um, I like I said, I le I learn a lot when I I I engage in this and facilitate this training. So we're going to have um, our lunch and then we we'll, we'll come back after lunch and just do one more case and do question and answers if there are any and we'll be the one. And then when we come Thank back, we're also going to be looking at some things we can do to prevent. Yeah. So some protocols, some things you can put in place. Uh, besides knowing what to do here, so what can we do? So Dr. Opisoye, Dr. Peter, we'll take some of these cases. They have some principles on their slides. We'll take some of these cases and just infuse this and this we can do to uh, prevent. So um, online audience, you two can go and have lunch, but you can have lunch online where we send it. <laughs> Check the chat, chat box for your, for your lunch. <laughs> so I have lunch for about 10 minutes. They are ready for us for about 10 minutes, and then we will. Uh... Thanks to patients and not. Don't forget that if you give information and the patient did not understand what you said, you've not given the information. That's important to know. Okay, so if you told me that uh, if you do this surgery, there's a chance I might lose my womb, but you didn't say it in a way I could understand, and I really didn't understand you, then if I lose my womb after that procedure, I can. I can create chaos, even if you end up winning the case, but I could have we said the doctor's career for several years. So we should make sure we should endeavor to make give adequate information before um before taking consent from our patients. I think that's that. Okay. So never rush to take recent consent. Sometimes we do this a lot. That is by the time, I mean, you have X cases to do, and then you just have to get this consent like now, 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 and just literally, you're just sending them where you just sign here. Okay? The time of taking the consent actually gives us an opportunity to run through the case with the patients. Running through the case with the patients, meaning you just let them know everything that could happen, basically. And doing that uh, is important. It's important. And ideally, it should be done by the procedural as the person doing the procedure. But of course, it can also be delegated to any other member of the team that is quite experienced with it and has a working knowledge of it. Obviously, someone that does not know the details of a procedure cannot take consent of for it because, of course, you don't have the information. You don't know how likely it is for this complication to happen or for the procedure not even to work at all. Okay, so that's important. And of course, the information about the plan outcomes, another possible outcome should be discussed. Okay, so I could do this surgery for you, go fail. You may need to do a bigger surgery. You may need to repeat. Just kind of, just kind of information should be discussed. No matter how unpalatable they are, um, it's it's the day to save you. It's the day you remember that okay, I both have done this. And of course, all common complications should be discussed. And then rare but important complication complications should also be discussed. I think there's a typo there. And of course, information leaflets or relevant web pages are all, mm -hmm. always very helpful. But by the time the patient reads it, in fact, that's one of my easiest ways to convince patients because by the time you saw our, many of our patients have the unibo complex or inferiority complex, by the time you saw the same thing discussed by an unibo person or unibo website, usually the body just comes out of this the thing that doctor has been telling me since. So, so that can, that information should be clear and it should be sufficient, it should be accurate in a way patients can understand. This is often tough. The truth is that the health literacy in the Nigerian space is much, much lower compared to many other places. Okay, but we're in Abuja again, 
and it's as good as it gets air. So I think we should make the efforts to, again, one, one patient requires, is not one another patient requires. Some patients you have to speak pigeon, some patients you have to draw, some you have to show pictures, some you have to show videos. But as much as possible, that communication needs to be done. Now, many times the time we roll up our sleeves and try to work hard is when complications have happened already and patients are trying to create trouble. But the truth is that the way to set the stage to prevent this is all the work you do before that time. And uh, when we are giving the patients information, we should listen to them. It's not a one way of care. You should try to listen to them, listen to what they are saying, or what they are trying to say, or what they are not saying. And that should actually give you uh, an idea of the issues you still have to address. Um, there's a patient in which we, I had the procedure, we did it, it seemed to be the procedure for the patient sometimes, and the expectations was clearly discussed. I mean, I'm aware that the expectation was clearly discussed, but now after the procedure, the patient said that, no, you didn't tell me that this could happen. No. I think they said it over and over again, and they created trouble for it. So it is, there's no saying of this too much. And uh, I, there's sometimes in which the patient is not so keen to refuse him to receive the information, but we should try our best to make sure that we try to get across to the patient. So I think these are just important things to check when we're giving patient information. Is the risk understood? That's one. Our alternatives have they been discussed and provided? That's secondly. And of course, have we made the information in a very clear format so that the patient can understand? And of course, the patient should always know that they have the option to refuse treatments. They also have the option to go to Dr. Okonko's facility. Is it Dr. Okonko's facility? <laughs> so when things go wrong now, one of the first things is to make sure that we inform them at the earliest opportunity when things don't go as planned. And um, yes, it sets off panic mode, but it keeps people in the loop. It keeps people in the loop. So mama's breathing is somehow, and uh, because of that, I've said that they should start out on oxygen. Our mama seems, our blood level seems to be going low. We're not sure why we're doing this and that. That just keeps them in the communication. Now, sometimes you do this and then everything just settles out and they see you as if you cry wolf. But that's often better than just leaving them in the dark until the last moment, okay? And then let it be very obvious. Let it be seen. Let it be known that you took steps to prevent that complication. Of course, that's usually pre procedure. But usually, and that's why when we counsel patients for procedures, as we are seeing the potential complications, we tell them the things you do to prevent that kind of a thing. Okay, so we're giving blood. Sometimes we can have blood reaction, but we actually do group and cross match work. It takes also time to make sure. So just those kind of things, saying that before, we make it obvious that you took steps to prevent the complications. And of course, when the complications happen, again, like now Lagos case, you should make it clear and obvious to everybody, particularly your family members, that you did everything possible to mitigate the situation. That is, when you need to run around to get an aesthetics, when you need to run around to get this, to get that, to get to transfer to ICU, those kind of things to mitigate the situation, it should be obvious to not like you did all your works and then family was not sure, they didn't even know that you're doing anything. And then you now told them that their loved ones that this has happened to. No, they don't want to hear that. And then of course, it's important to listen to and consider the input of the patients and the relations to the management, no matter how useless it is. Okay, listening to and just deliberate with them, let them know that okay, you think we should give. No master line instead of blood like you No master line will know what. So just listen to them. It's important to uh, to listen to, particularly when they have one doctor in their family or one doctor they've been using before. Listen to get that person on board. Let the person be part of your team. Okay. The person say if they say the person wants to discuss with your team, it's not you know that's when I say like, no, 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 I can't talk somewhere I don't know, somewhere they will say, and then you just push them aside. So those things are okay. And then we shall go cues and portray a non-channel disposition. As I'm reading that now out now. I remember the person that went to take lunch, okay? And the way they put it in that story actually suggests that, so, I mean, he was not interested in monitoring and things like that, particularly a hospital that may not have enough expertise, no SR, no registrar, maybe it's just one MO that is sitting there. So nothing that should portray non challenge disposition. No, a patient is distracted and then staff is chatting and laughing outside, okay? Or you are just watching TV or playing game on your phone, whereas staff is distracted. But yes, people have been doing everything else possible, but. No, they don't want to see that. They don't want to see that they are being taken very seriously. And of course, communication remains very important. It's something that we can never overdo. We should communicate, communicate, communicate. So thank you very much. I think I'll leave it there. Are there any questions? Are there any questions or contributions?
And then the question of contributions. We talk about a number of things. One is bringing that doctor in abroad. Bring that person in. Make them, <laughs> and then you make them a part of your team. Ask if they have any other questions. So that framework of IDEX that is there, one of the protocols that we use in our hospital, we have modified it. We add Q at the end H. and H at the end. And Q is to end every, we, we say that end every discussion with you have any questions. And every single communication with do you have any questions? So even that informed consent you think you have taken, if you don't do that, you, people may have questions that you may not solve them. So acknowledge, greet, introduce yourself, introduce the patients. When you are discussing big things like procedures, deterioration, ICU care, don't do it standing. Don't do it by the word side, by the word round, and have another call. So this is what's happening. Try not to do, I'm telling you, these are things from experience. I don't know this is a book. It should be in the book somewhere. Okay, so in Kuma and Clark, there's something called spikes, which is check the setting first, number one. Then ask them the perception. What do you think that he said? What do you expect? Then, so we typically take them downstairs in our facility, sit down in the consultation room, ask them. Sometimes we tell them, you know what? Is there another person you want? We will meet by two o'clock. Call everybody that you want to be here. They call everybody, then you sit down. This is what's happening, this is what's happening. Now there's something they also mentioned. When something goes wrong, part of ethics, medical ethics is to own up. This has gone wrong. A complication has happened. How do people do that? It's a controversial topic. Even when I was doing my MBA in healthcare, it's something that uh, they must believe that we should be done more, but we in Africa feel that hmm. <laughs> <laughs> just passing but my mama did not do well. But don't, don't worry, don't worry, it will be better eventually. No, we did a procedure, we had this complication. And if you did a good informal consent, one of the things I like to say is let the surgeon or the physician or the consultant doing the procedure take the consent. Don't give somebody a system who said the nurse. We say they are they able to buy it. No, take the con so that complication we talked about. Unfortunately, it happened here. Most patients will accept it. If you have spoken to them about it, you say that this happens in 1%. We don't over 500 cases, it does not happen. In this case, it has happened. Yes, so 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 and so. We did this extra step. So now this has happened, and this is what we are doing about it. And we expect XYZ. That's what they say, what they call it. Not declaration. Disclosure. Thank you. Is disclosure that disclosure goes a long way. Now it can go both ways. It can form ammunition for a case because the case could have turned out and that thing you thought you were disclosing. So if, if disclosure to the most senior member of the team, let the doctor not say, mm, okay. like they put the needle for the wrong place. So. <laughs> <laughs> and say they're just disclosing. <laughs> Lose lips, sink ships. Lose lip, lip sync ships. And almost all of these cases, there's always communication inappropriate, typically from another member of staff that added fuel to the fire. <laughs> that man, I saw they do. I saw the other woman die the other day. They just catch. So there are always those loose lips that sink ships. So after you have done all that you're supposed to do, still make sure that you keep your lips loose. So disclosure is very important. For procedure heavy institutions, and which is where most of the litigation comes in. If it's non procedural, you know, we can explain ourselves when you know the potassium went up and this one went down, and then we can explain ourselves out of it. But for procedural heavy ones, you need to follow these steps sit down, disclose, follow the framework, end the framework with a queue. Do you have any questions? And then answer any questions openly. Also ask, is there another person that they want to be in the room? So and those are critical things. I think that has been really, really helpful. So before we get to the point where we are now, document that discussion, the details as much as possible. Also document what they said or what they did not say. Sometimes what you could have told you, I do not think I want Mama to be resuscitated in the event. So uh, we deal with a lot of strokes and you know end stage heart disease and stuff like that. And they say, look, this person has suffered enough. Now, that person that told you will not be the one that, like we saw in all the cases, the people and the doctors, almost all the cases, it was, it was the same thing. 
The people that the doctor was relating with were not the people that ended up suing them. Another group of people that knew no knew not what Joseph did. Abi, <laughs> come up and raise it up. And they are always willing lawyers to take up the case. So if you had brought them in early, if you had had enough disclosure, it would have been gone a long way. Um, finally, this is counseling pre-procedure. I've talked about post-procedure. When something has gone wrong, the patient has died. What do you do? How do you counsel at that time? One of the things that I've learned over time is if the person died and you went on to the next case, I see the person was a number. Even if you did everything correct, you are likely to end up. So we're talking about preventing litigation. So if the person has died, you must have that appearance of calm, of solemn. You must spend time. Don't say that you're afraid that the relatives are going to do whatever. You must spend time seated with them. Quiet. No doctor should have done this. Keep quiet. Be cautious. Every time you are discussing in a difficult situation, imagine and expect that you are being recorded. You call on the phone, you say, okay, speak to this person. Expect that you are being recorded. So do not say, oh God, look, I tried my best. So don't be careful. Expect that you are being recorded. And most times you are. Even that meeting that I say you call them to the room, or more, more often than not, we eventually find out that we are being recorded. So when they come in and they are laying acquisitions, expect that you are being recorded. Now, there's another model that, we, that I use. It's called iHeart, and I'll share it with you. That is when things have gone wrong. The patient is now angry. Something has gone wrong. What do you do? iHeart. I isolate. Let them not have an audience to be shouting at, you see this doctor? Bring them to a room, sit them down. I, H, hear them out. Hear out everything they want to say. Hear it properly. Listen. Actively listen. Mm, yes. Oh. No, but you see them. Listen. Don't interject. Studies have shown that when a doctor does not interject a patient, they do not talk more than two minutes. So you might think that you want to hasten them, but really you are actually prolonging it. And the person feels that they are not heard. Anytime anybody is raising their voice, it's because they think they're not being heard. So they think they need to raise it a decibel higher to be able to hear, particularly if you are doing your face in different manners. E is to empathize. I understand. I understand how you are feeling like this. I understand the pain you are feeling. Or I think I have an understanding. Empathize. Then A, apologize. Now, I know there are some schools of thought that said apology could be construed as a form of guilt. When you apologize that something went wrong, that it could be construed. But no, the studies, at least the ones published in the Journal of American, Med Med American Medical Association, show that those who that apologize have less litigations. They are less likely to go to litigation. That's number one. Number two, apology is not necessarily an, an admission of guilt. When you apologize, you, are, you could be apologizing for the way things went out, went, went turned out. You could be apologizing for the way the person feels. But please don't say, I apologize for the way you feel. That's telling that, I, that you are your own. It's your problem. Okay? So, but it, you understand? So take that apology in that. And most lawyers will say that while you are talking, if you use words or writing, if you use words like without prejudice, it kind of insulates what you have said. Am I correct, sir? It kind yes. of insulates yes. insulates what you have when, said. When you say without prejudice, you are not admitting, um, you don't want that particular point to be, to be used in the event of a crisis. Exactly. So if you're even writing a letter, and I've had to write a letter to family to say, oh, we're very sorry about the loss. Some of those key words needs to show up in that context, okay? Text message, um, WhatsApp, be careful what you communicate in those things, okay? Um, as much as possible. So um, I'm on E, Abby. A, apology, Abby. So apologize, apologize how things went out, see what you did and all of that. Then R, what is R? What's that? Okay, have we remind you? Okay, sure. But R is a remedy. If there's a remedy, give it. 
If it's death, of course, there's no remedy. So, I mean, that's what it is. But otherwise, if it's a remedy, somebody is angry about something, you can remedy, okay, we're going to do X, Y, Z. We're going to give you free service here and there. We're going to do this for you. Um, this competition happened. We are going to have free and physical therapy services in this hospital as long as this person needs it. All of that is a way. It's not, and of course, you must make sure to say that I understand. We are not trying, this will not make up for what has gone wrong, but this is a kind of remedy we are bringing forward to help the situation. And then thank them, T. Thank them. Thank them for listening. Thank them for choosing you. Thank them for hearing you out and all of that. It works. It works. Okay. If you follow this um, communication protocol, it will be typically only people that are not in that room that will go on to Costro. Typically. So I want to believe that these cases follow this protocol, hopefully, but they did not do the first thing make sure that everybody that needed to be in that room was there. If they did that, they will not be in this situation. So that's very important about preventing, about preventing um, litigation. All right, are there any questions or contributions that we want to have um, add to this? Let me just, um, emphasize on the concept um, that uh, that the doctor has traditionally is actually called paternalism. Um, paternalism is the name given to the attitude of the doctor that gives you that professional air that you know everything as far as this um, as, as, a, 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 as far as this treatment or this issue is concerned. So it's, it's, um, it's the principle of consent stroke paternalism. So the, the paternal medical practitioner actually feels that I don't need your contribution. Okay. I, I, I and this is my first idea of a doctor. And that's basically the way um, when I was a child, I walked into the I, I, I walk into the consulting room and then he's seated and then he's writing. I've not said anything, he's writing. <laughs> and in my mind, I'm just wondering, what's this guy's writing? He said, um, uh, doctor, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, I have malaria. I said, who's told you it's malaria? And then, uh, okay, I'm feeling pains here, fever, he looks at me and he's writing, he occasionally just puts up his eyes, you know, let me remove my glasses. So you see, you know, he puts up his eyes, yes, any fever, touches my eyes a little bit. And then he's, he's writing the prescription with his um, nice writing, you know, and then he tears the thing out. He says, go to the pharmacy. You know, I feel I would, I'm just a number. You see, that thing you are describing, I think it's rare. That, I mean, Dr. Seko, you, you get what I mean? That, that communication you are describing. Maybe again, you could do it for major procedure. I don't know, since you are, you are your own site, you have specialist hospitals. But the bulk of medical practitioners in Nigeria actually treat patients as numbers, maybe because you are busy, as it were. So that's one aspect. The other aspect actually is because the person actually needs to, I think that's how I get the, the point you are making that look, the perception of the person is also very crucial. I mean, the person needs to, the person, the patient needs to feel that I matter and I have something to give. So I'm saying that, look, I'm having a stomach ache here. And then he takes out his stethoscope or whatever it is it's called. And then he says, no, you cannot be feeling pains there because all the examinations and the laboratory. I say, come on, excuse me. I'm the one that has my body. I'm telling you I'm feeling this. You know, so I, I, I want to think, just to add to that um, um, communication and the paternal, uh, it's actually 
a well-researched um, area of medical ethics that the doctor should, there should be a balance between informed, um, informed consent and the professionalism, the air of professionalism that the doctor has always been known with and has been respected for with dignity and uh, all the candor that the profession carries with it. I just wanted to add that, Dr. So, so I think the next person can take the... Yes, yeah, somebody has something to say. Uh, you know, um, neurosurgeons, it, where I trained, used to say that we are not God, but we are pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I literally say we're not God, but we're, we're pretty close. <laughs> and in the way they walk, when you talk to them, they look at you, you behind the tower. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I think that is a, a point of concern for me as a person. And I want to categorically see that business especially medical business is driven by communication. This we must know. For the cases we have reviewed today, I have this conclusion even before now that I'm sorry there are soldiers here. That's why I was trying to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so those that do procedures and those that don't, I don't want to call soldier physicians so that some people don't feel. I noticed that those that do procedures go to legal side more than those that do not. And it goes back to here. I mean, just to say, yes. Surgeons, like he said, I have had a lot of them. Patients will come to them, like one of them recently was referred from one center to an advanced center, so to say. As she was entering, the doctor said to her, Madam, go back, go back. Before we start talking, go and reduce your weight. The woman felt bad. She was confused. She wanted to cry. She came all the way from another state to another state. And this is an open statement of fundamental concern. Okay, I want to say, I don't know that soldiers are likely. Having this concept, I call lack of medical humility. I might be wrong. They don't tend to communicate. They are always in a move to let me go and debug this thing. Let me go and remove this thing. Let me go and do this thing. I have another one. I have another one. Because of that, communication is zero. And it is that communication that the patient comes for. Truly, some of them don't, their concern is not that this thyroid or this swelling will be removed. No. Some of them just wanted to hear something that is lacking. And it all boils back to uh, communication. I must say, thank you, Dr. Hope, for that wonderful presentation. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we've learned a lot. Dr. Peter is going to, going to take us through something briefly to 15 minutes, and then we'll... Everybody has, there's a, there's a feedback form um, in your job, in your file folder. If you can just help us fill it before you leave, so that we can use to improve this. This is the first uh, uh, medical legal summit. Uh, next year will definitely be bigger. We we'll just this is a pilot. We we'll used to learn a lot of things, to fine tune a lot of things. So we expect to do better and bigger next year, much bigger. If you're online and you have a question, please um, uh, put it in the chat box.
in the Q and A box. Record is John Dist. So Dr. Peter, the MD of Children's Hospital, Living Children's Hospital, will do his brief presentation for 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Um, good afternoon, all. Um, it's been an enlightening yes. session so far. So this is I'm from Living Hospital and the Children's Hospital in particular. Okay, those who have not seen an incubator. My daughter said she wants to come for a discussion to see how incubators look like. I'll take permission before that happens. Hmm? Okay, fine. So we want to look at preventing litigations, looking at clinical protocols and tips. Um, to set the stage for this presentation, we want to state that we've known before now that health has three dimensions, the triangle of health, physical health, the mental health, and social health. So we doctors, we are interfacing with the patient that most likely has a physical health condition. And then with relatives that have, the situation would likely have generated an unstable mental condition. And then possibly we ourselves have our own physical, mental, and social health problems. Do you really, do you understand? So you are trying to solve a, a situation that is multifaceted. And all these, both the patients, the caregivers, are all potentialities that it's important to bear this in mind. Um, when there is a civil wrong, which we want to prevent, um, the claimants we have to prove that, first of all, there was a duty of care that they, that, was initiated because of a contract between the healthcare provider and the patient. So um, it could be in the consulting room, it could be on phone. So we, you started making prescription on phone, which we shy away from very, very seriously because I, when I came, I said the, the, the screen was jaundiced. I cannot see jaundice in a unit from a distance. And even if a unit has jaundice, the severity they are all different. So but once I engage in that communication, um, care has started. Um, and if there is a breach of that care and there is harm that is suffered as a result of that, the parents have points to prove. Um, just to continue by saying that we do not have that liberty, probably like the apprentice in Zuba, learning from our mistakes. So we don't have that liberty to learn from our mistakes. We get it right. Okay, yeah, we have doctors at various levels of specialties, but we work at our level of efficiency and we get it right the first time and always. Um, it's important to know that prevention of mitigation is better than cure because apart from the, the, the money that may be um, lost, time wasted, uh, peace of mind, prayer points for years. We don't want that. Um, and it's been said, even from the discussion around the last presentations, that doctors are no longer regarded as invaluable, uh, beyond question. So people, people get to know a lot before coming. So while we are current with our practice, we also respect the knowledge of the people we see. So looking at um, protocols, protocols and guidelines. They are really, really important in everything we do in medical practice. So I was in theater last two weeks and there is a nurse, one of the theater nurses who read through, they always read, okay, patients identified any um, anticipated critical surgery. But 
the way the way she vibrated the stuff, and we identified ourselves. I say, please, when I grow up, I want to become like you. <laughs> you get the point. It was coming from inside. It was coming from. There was no way you would miss any issue. And the woman was obese. Finally, getting spinal access was really difficult. But everything was done the way it should be done. So it's important that we follow laid down guidelines um, so that we uh, avoid uh, litigations, things going the wrong way. It will facilitate the standardization of practice because this, this is the theta protocol before surgery starts. So this theta nurse is on duty this morning. This is what she's going to do. By 6 o'clock, another 6 p.m., another duty sheet. It's the same practice that is followed. So it's not like as though there are some experts, some people who are so good, but the same guideline is followed. Um, if there is harm that is avoidable, it would be avoidable. It's important that patient safety is improved. But there is this aspect of it. So uh, this morning I was I'm reading a, sorry, just personal, PRISMA guideline for systematic reviews and meta-analysis. It's 25 pages. So if I am reading guideline that is 25 pages, if the theater guideline that the nurse is going to follow is 25 pages, um, you know, it, it will result to the kind of thing that happened at the Tower of Babel because we start hearing different, <laughs> you get the point. So the simple thing is we get standard guidelines. We adapt them or customize them locally to be applicable. It's kept as short and simple, but comprehensive as it should be. So we think of any procedure at all. Um, comments that have come so far have said that when procedures are more, chances of litigations are more. So for every procedure, we have um, protocols for them, and we follow them. Tested, either proven before, maybe from um, outside, or we know that this is what we do here that everybody follows. So we keep it very, very simple. Um, we'll look at some tips around avoiding litigations. Empathy has been talked about a lot. So we always have this, this what I call it, confusion between empathy, sympathy, uh, but it should also end in compassion. Let's see how they are related. So something has happened, I understand. So that you understand is the sympathy. You feel so we cannot have an incongruous affect. Something has happened wrong, and then we are laughing. We it can it doesn't connect, it doesn't connect. So the affect that is congruous with the situation, we should so something has happened. I must not shed tears with the patient. At times we you unconsciously you find yourself cleaning your eyes. Uh, but you feel the suffering anyway. So that's uh, the empathy. But if it stops at that point, then it doesn't, it's not complete. So you want to relieve the suffering. So the analogy here, I do not know there's a part of the country, please, if you're from that place, you don't know whether even me are from that place, where uh, they have hired mourners. So during burial, they pay people to cry. Now, these people who are paid to cry don't even understand what has happened. So you cannot jump. So they jump from there's no sympathy for this query empathy. So it cannot tra it cannot translate to compassion. You get the point. Okay, I long ago during housemanship, I was um, treating, I was in an emergency room and the child came with tetanus, an eight-year-old girl, so not neonatal, full grown. And the whole community, the people around, the people of the yard came into emergency room. Okay, it was in the hospital. I won't mention the name in my state. You don't know my state. <laughs> okay, now, because we don't easily just get there, there's no emergency box where I could go and get the asthma. This child is having spasm. There's nothing. So, how okay. I So, you write the drug. Somebody will go and cure in emergency, uh, the pharmacy and get it. So, I've written the drug. Out of all these people that came, nobody accepted to go to get the drugs. But they've come, maybe they are sympathizing, right? They understood. So sorry, I was mad. I said, everybody, please get out. They would just shift. So I ran, got the drug, brought, gave, calmed the child before we started. And sympathy, empathy that does not translate to compassion is an aborted process. Hmm?
Okay, so now the risk of litigation is less if somebody feels you are human. If our humanity is not lost in the process of our profession, it looks a little more like less likely that um, the risk of litigation is less. A lot of talk has gone on around informed consent. I emphasize that it's not just consent because if it's not backed by information, by knowledge, by comprehension, um, it could turn the other way. And it's not just information because you actually want to get them to consent. So what is to be done is clearly spoken, broken down in the language that can be understood. So if we need interpreter, if we need to use PG English to bring it down to their level, we'll do it. Um, we talk about the possible risks and complications, but not about errors, because I'm not supposed to preempt you that it's likely that I'm going to make, that I'm going to an exchange blood transition, um, and sometimes the umbilical venous catheter will pull out. That one is out of, that's totally out of the way. So alternative treatments, I think in, this would have been important if possible. This issue of blood transfusion, alternative treatments come maybe in cold cases, not emergency cases, but if they are alternative treatments, fine. Now, in medications, if no treatment is done or if treatment is delayed, must be very clear at the point of communication. Whenever we want to do the important, so I find in my practice that uh, when I was told by one the lecturer that taught us acute osteomyelitis in sickle cell, treatment is four to six weeks on antibiotics. They need to be on bed rest. But will you get somebody to accept? So you many times, in fact, the case I said I did pericardial synthesis for was a septic emboli from the point of um, acute osteomyelitis. That was how it came along. So, but you, the parents will not accept easily to stay with the child in the hospital. Maybe for two, three weeks, at least let symptoms clear. It's very difficult. So we do this by getting, we have a seminar room. So we get, yes, I had to go with the two, um, my the ward round team. The mother was there and the uncle who held the child and who was asking so many questions in the semi-private room where there are two people. I can't do the counseling there because there's another person. So we have to go to center and sat down. So you sit down and so there is, so technically the mother has a weakness that she permitted. I have my own weakness. It's done under clear condition. They wanted to go, they accepted to stay at the end of the long discussion and questions and answers. We must not fail to get informed consent because it will go in ahead without it is bad, bad thing. Documentation is key. That has saved a lot of one of some of the cases that we discussed earlier. So we do it carefully. And the problem is during emergencies, some people are busy doing what is supposed to be done, but neglect. So they forget. So I do not know, you pay tithes of that and that, and for, we forgot the weightier matters. Of the law. So um, documenting is one of the weighty, weighty matters of the law, is weighty matters of the law. What we are doing is weighty matters of clinical care. Somebody should be doing the documentation. Worst case scenario, it's completed as well as a late documentation, especially if it's electronic medical record where it, the time where you enter shows at that point. So it's shown as a late documentation. When documentation is done by a junior colleague, it's the responsibility of the senior to still look at what is documented. So we do not have a unit that entered the intensive care unit as a male unit, and four days later becomes a female unit, and then you wonder whether there's transgender compliant unit or intensive care unit. And so that, that's really, really bad. So it's important to avoid pointers to fabrication. Now, this is common in places where you will write notes, case files. When handwritings change, and it should actually be a flow of thoughts, it raises some red flags. When ink change, that is by writing with blue and now becomes black, and it actually should be a continuum. When documentation is illegible, for those doctors that don't have good handwriting, <laughs> but those those few doctors that don't have good handwriting, calm down. When you calm down and you write 
hold the pen upright. You usually <laughs> hold it better. So inconsistencies in uh, different entries. So that, I think that comes in clearly when you talk about numbering the pages. So it's very relevant. So we want to avoid the use of non-standard abbreviations, both in writing and even during word rounds. Uh, some doctors write abdomen, you said losoko, that's liver zero, kidney zero. And I went to customer care and I was all writing, what is losoko? <laughs> okay, um, yes, <laughs> I saw it. Okay, and then during what round, I was told in school that, uh, so we say some things at the bedside that we just have to be a little more careful. Abdomen palpated, liver, liver not palpable, spleen not palpable, and the woman shouted, means the child does not have liver. No, no, you said, hey, no liver, no spleen, no kidney. You come on, you say that. The woman started crying, so my child does not have liver, does not have spleen, does not have kidney. So we avoid the use, even common use of ACT has caused problems in our branch before we, the child is on ACT, and the father says, what is ACT? ACT, what is ACT? Okay. I've heard where the doctor said, we have raised the investigation of the unit, and the father is a customs officer, thinking of biomedical, and then what, why are you investigating my, what crime? No, I've seen it. <laughs> so, so why we say communication is important? It's really important. Okay. So we manage um, cases within the area of our expertise and facilities. Let that a lot to be our just keep then audit is important to have a unit that does audit and for people in management position to review folders. It's important to at least get a proto a protocol, a format for word round documentations. For every word round that we review, we should find this, this, this. It should be very clear. Now um, we have standard operating proce uh, procedures for all our protocols. For example, if we have to refer a patient, the, the, the standard form should carry what it should be. And then what we get, so at times we get patients that are referred to us without some um, standard codings of standard. Those ones when we get a back referral, those things politely state that we have. When we follow up, so follow up, so the unit has standard protocols also. And we are discharging a neonate, a preterm unit from the intensive care unit. We know the risk of anemia or prematurity commonest at six weeks. So we want to fix the appointment just a few days before six weeks. So we catch it, preempt before it actually happens. So if everybody is aware of this, so procedures for blood transfusion, surgical theater check is important. Now, again, I said it should be very simple, straight to the point. Like the guideline I was reading that is 25 pages. The Prisma guideline for systematic reviews, 25 pages, and it's just guideline. Yeah? So, but for work, hospital work, we make it very, very simple. Just a page that can state what is supposed to be done, who is supposed to do it, how is it supposed to be done. Very simple, just paste it maybe inside the label word, inside the theater, easy to do. Follow. For example, the steps for resuscitation, we know the steps where it follows a flow chart, everybody can easily follow it. Our communication, this has been said over and over. It's important between the doctor and the patient, but more important between the doctor and the important is somebody else that is important. It's important I always state my name. I am Dr. Dr. So, so and so. I this is my status consultant. This is very, very simple. State it now. The diagnosis should be stated what it is, the prognosis. And any uncertainties requiring further investigation does not mean we are doing guesswork. So, when people say, Yes, the child had acute pharyngitis, and the doctors were doing guesswork with the antibiotic until 48 hours after the culture came. No, it's not. So, that's where communication comes. There is an empirical treatment based on standard guidelines that we follow. If the culture comes out and if the child is already improving or it falls within sensitivity pattern, fine. So uh, these things, we hear this kind of um, comments when communication was not done well. So management options, likely consequences, I think this has been treated by the previous presenter. Look at a few challenging situations that we may face in practice. What, what if we have an emergency situation and the 
yes, is unable to make payment for service. And we need something to do that is life saving. Now, healthcare is a social good, um, but it will money answers all things. It was because somebody else paid that there was money in the system to get those things that would help. What do we do? I think I'm happy the way the barrister is looking at me because I know he's going to make comments here. So, but I will try carefully by saying, do not refuse life-saving treatments. Many times, those things are very simple, maybe like doing a random touch, uh, maybe like commencing um, IV um, normal cell like and maybe just like inserting suppository like Novena to bring the temperature down. Those basic ones. But get proper documentation from any of the legal uh, representatives, maybe the parents. At least they are going to make payments. But when we get the, I wanted to say child now, when we get the person, the patient out of that situation, full communication and what should be done, should be done there. Now, what if we find something unanticipated during a procedure. That's actually very, very possible and very likely, of course. Although some of the concerns we see for surgery, we say you leave it to the discretion of the surgeon. Sometimes it sound, looks very, very vague. What if it happens? Nothing wrong to call in the legal guardian. There's nothing wrong with the, uh, any, the husband coming into a theater at times when people want to be there. When my daughter was operated, I was in theater, not as a doctor or like a father at that point. And I had to hold my hands together so I don't talk. Okay, so let them understand the unanticipated event, but um, needed plan of care. So if there's need for an emergency resection and anastomosis should be clear. Um, if possible, this would be videoed or get evidence for it. Um, deterrent, this serves as deterrent for patient uh, guardian to sue because they are involved, there is evidence of the interaction that was documented. If we have valid or the visual legal records, fine. When things go wrong, we've talked a lot about it, but just to say that the quality of doctor-patient interaction and care is inversely associated with the um, patient's complaints. So better doctor-patient relationship, very much likely less complaints. I always laugh about this during ward round and I said, okay, um, we're going to discharge the child. Now, any question? Usually no question at that point. But when we finish everything, I say, okay, we'll see tomorrow, but do we have any question? Then you have a lot of questions coming because people want to go home, especially close to festivities. Hmm? So, but it's important that a good quality, quality relationship over time at every point we meet the patients, it matters because it's like um, this relationship bank that you withdraw from after some time, if absolutely necessary. Non disclosure um, of error, non disclosure of error increases the likelihood of seeking legal advice or litigation. So one cannot just keep it. People are wiser these days, and every adverse outcome presents an opportunity to alter the patient's experience for good or for bad. So how we relate to them for that case and for subsequent cases. So it doesn't help anybody to sweep um, things under the carpet. What do we do when things go wrong? A truthful discussion um, that is satisfactory at the level of communication is very, very important. And we respectfully acknowledge the concerns of the patient. Nobody comes to hospital expecting when things go wrong, but if it ever happens, there must be respect and there's a sincere expression of regret. The next slide we'll look into just, which is our last slide actually, we talk about um, some of those protocols. So we make a plan to address ongoing care and um, resolve the problem as soon as possible. Um, we make plans to prevent it from happening, but disclosure is important. The emotion that is shown, we know that the words carry less strength than even the body language, the tone of voice, and everything that we see. It matters a lot. So, um, communicating when things go wrong. We've seen the IDET model, we've seen the IHAT, but this is the assist model when things go wrong. So, we acknowledge it, although we didn't anticipate that this would happen. 
and we express sorrow for it, um, express the regret that is appropriate for it. But then we hear them talk about what they know, what they feel about it. And we are open to answer questions. We will seek the solutions to the problem at hand and will create time to go over it over and over. So it is not a one-off event. That done, they are fully aware of whatever has happened. We have fully interacted. And because a step is taken for solution, our humanity is not questioned in the interaction. This is how I will conclude this presentation. Clinical practices like driving through an accident prone highway, like the airport road, and just like airport road or Ubuwa expressway. Now, make sure that there is a competent driver. That driver is that you stay within the limits of your experience. Do not overspeed. Don't go beyond, beyond 120 kilometers per hour. Stay within your level of experience. And make sure that the ignition is working fine. Before you start any procedure, get informed consent. And you want to be sure that the engine oil, the fuel, whether um, tanker stop before local jack, make sure that whether there's no scarcity, have enough fuel in the car. That is the documentation, your medical records must be as robust as possible. Um, let your Google map be intact in communication. That will help navigate your plan along the road. And your brake is working fine, no way to stop so that you avoid accidents. So we do not want information. Thank you. If you know these things, happy and you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Peter. There are some questions online. I don't know if there are questions here. We are about rounding up. Uh, oh, can't hear anymore. Can anyone hear? I can't hear anything. You're muted. Oh, what happened? Online guys knocked out. Oh, no. I feel so bad. Wonderful presentation. Oh. Once again, thank you. So any question? Yes, sir, please. Yes, comments, okay. Yes. So it's about consent, product of consent. Now, if you are this, and the patient is brought in with a stab wound to the chest, stab wound to the chest, and uh, you do your x ray and you find massive hematoids. This patient was brought to me by a casual friend who just brought a print in, it, like we see, the most government hospitals visit. And he goes away, the person goes away and gives the patient there. Do everything possible, maybe you even go as far as opening a credit card for the patient to get material to me. How do you get the consent from that kind of patient? And if you do it, if you end up passing the chest tube, for instance, as part of your management, and at the end, things go wrong. How do you remove yourself out of it as a doctor? Then talking about the aspect of restraining yourself to your line of expertise. Is it proper or is it permitted for, let's say, a general medical officer? For instance, the general operation department to sit in for a surgeon who, you know, for instance, is a urologist. Is this proper or is it permitted from the legal aspect? Then finally, uh, we want to find out if it's possible for us to get uh, some of these slides or all for other studies on our own. Okay, please. Yes, certainly. You get the Thank slides you. On your, if you have your email. Um, Pamela. Right. The emails, uh, if you have your email, the emails, the materials will be um so will be sent. Yes, you. materials will be sent to you. Um the, I, I didn't get the aspect of the doubling for you are one you are a general medical officer. You are a medical officer, you are not a urologist. Is it proper permitted for you to sit in and run a urology right. clinic for a urologist? I don't think so. I don't think so. That's I think that is. Am I maybe I should allow the doctors more from 
because oh there is no law against it i think there is okay doctor doctors are allowed to have people in the system younger doctors are assistants all over the world so even if nhs uk or london cardiologists their trainees are there here that allows to see patients for him. They are, of course, he has to review the patient himself as well. Okay. So, but someone can see first for him. So, even in teaching us with those medical students can see first under the direction of the consultant. The okay. The consultant has to handle the other look at the patient and say this, 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 that, and that. So, it's allowed under that context, under the supervision of. No, it's not available. He's not. He's saying there is no supervision. The next time, look at the record and see follow up the patient, for example. So, but under the supervision of. So that's the way it's framed now. The, the specifics of that can be a little bit complex. So if, if the diurology thing, for example, if the general doctor says, do PSA, do ultrasound scan, and he brings the results of the and sees the urologist himself, it's coordinated that that was fine. But now start running the clinic on behalf of a urologist that is somewhere that is not going to see that patient, now that's his family house. But now the nuances, sorry, the fine lines is what can be difficult to describe, but Again, starting from teaching hospitals. So in teaching hospitals like this, for example, the cardiology clinic usage, there may be two consultants in clinic or five SRs, about 10 reg registrars, or 15 house officers. A lot of them will see patients. Even with that, the clinic is still super full. Okay, but each of those patients will be filtered out through certain protocols. And of course, all of them should have the input of the consultants. So that's how we'll answer that. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. I think it's the, the in the standard setting, it's the medical officer that actually those who are going to start who has interest in the specialty, just like POPD, the lesser patients, the medical officers who are planning to specialize and they have experience in the protocols of those things. So it's a primary that thing. In shortage of consultants are special, so you can have one consultant who have a protocol. So in most cases, to allow facilitations. Most specialists normally put those things so that when you come in, you have seen those cases with them. Like for me, all my protocol for acne, I spend my medical officer to do my LH, FSH, to do some other or, or scanning. So once they come in, you come, you see acne cases, they present. So by the time I'm taking the final decision, okay, I'm seeing that. You, to, to allow the specialist to be seen every body to come in, some of them have to be filtered. That's the case of filter clinic. So you have a base. Where you have medical officers who are interested in what you are doing, one or two, or the rotates, you have now those in residency. If they are not there, the medical officer will have interest to be there so that he knows exactly what you want. For me, Dr. Paul, if I, if I see if they see any of my patients, I'm okay because it's going to sort them out. And by the time I'm seeing, I use two minutes. You get what I'm saying? But to, to say that, you, especially in my past, you know, even the best patient in the US, you have to sort out those, filter them, then sort it out. So that the colloquials just see, take back, back, back tissue. That's how it should be. But it's not okay. taking the health. But the protocol must have been on ground. It must have actually been there. Because the training you are really getting is practical certification. In most cases, when you do your a colloquial, you still have to get certifications doing training under a specialist for you to be a colloquial to be certified. So that training is more important. So if medical officers have gone through it, you know what is expected, can we do that for you? Why you just take the final decision? Thank you. Okay, I don't know if that's okay for you. That addresses the issue conclusively. Okay, the second, the other question um, is about consent. Can you just quickly run that again? Where you have an emergency, yes, emergency. and yes. someone is yes, yes. massive evacuator. What is yes, this chest tube? Yes, with no relation, no caregiver. So and then no money, obviously no money, no funds. Of course, we've rallied around that. We've been able to, you know, open a credit line for the patient in the government or private institution, whatever it is. But how do you obtain consent from such a patient? No, you, you, you the, I'm making you, your, your first line of duty is to save his life. No one is going to ask you for consent under that. Um, scenario or situation I, I was i was looking for there's a specific um i think rule 28 also there's a there's a specific rule that addresses that um that scenario right that you what you do on that 
a situation where there is a serious um, threat to life. There are even scenarios where someone um, has committed a crime. Or it's obvious that look, it's gone, it's a gunshot, not even knife. It's a gunshot might be, and doctors are usually like afraid and say, oh, this is going to relate to police case and, and stuff like that. It is still by medical ethics and law, it is still imperative that you save that life. And you do everything. It's a major um is a major aspect of medical ethics and law that it, that the doctor must employ the entire um, skill of his science to save life when um, it comes to his um, facility. That's 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 imperative. I'm sure nobody is going to ask you about the dynamics of consent or no consent. So the rule is not the rule for consent is not. Absolute. It has exceptions, and under that, that falls. Um, that that creates an except um, an exception. What? There's there's one more question. No. Okay. So thank you so much. Yes. Yes, sir. You 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 have a question. Please give. Um, Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. So, my patient, the nobody make this comment that if you're giving them drug, you don't hide anything. But when you're taking them for surgery, you will not allow their relatives to go into theater with you. Like some of the antenatal women that eventually end up with uh, abdominal delivery, so to say. They will want their spouse to come into theater with them because they have oftentimes seen online that outside Nigeria, for example, they allow their spouse to come along with them. But in Nigeria, that practice is not well established. I'm just wondering, are we afraid of the medical aspect of it, because some of them will paint the picture that it is going to support care. They are going there to support the care. That's the picture they paint. So I don't know. I know a, I know a hospital that um, will discuss all that. If some of them will allow you, or just one person. Um, some have a, they have a camera in the theater, they let you know that this thing is being recorded if your concerns, but they will not allow you in. I think it boils down to the, the set protocols of the hospital and then the consultant in charge, that the person who is leading the team in charge. Um, I think that is not so much a matter of ethics. I, I've not, I can't see anything in the Code of Medical Ethics that addresses that um, specifically. So, but in Nigeria, there are places where law works. Let me paint a picture. You are in the you are in the consulting room, and someone starts crying. I believe the, the there are procedures that are sensitive, and you need. You don't you don't want any distraction because of the nature of the procedure that is going on in there and so i i i, I want to believe that the each hospital and each consultant irrespective of the hospital should determine what works for him and the discretion should be that of either the consultant or the or the other hospitals. So there should be guidelines um, governing things like that. And there should be reasons. Like I said, if someone has the, if you are not sure that you are going to have total um, informed cooperation as far as the procedure is concerned, then the distraction should be shut out. That's my own personal opinion. I don't know if it's 
not, I don't think this is much a matter of um, medical legal law. Yes, thanks. Just to add to it. So I think the because even the doctor can be distracted, it's even if it's not a surgical procedure. And so I admitted the child from cleaning, child that has had pibrite convulsions before, got into an emergency room. And the next time I heard the shout, um, the child was convulsing. The mother was every the whole book, it just had to come in. The child is convulsing. convulsing. The nurses had already gotten the drug from the uh, drug emergency board. And I can look at it. We are in, we take good care of your child. If you do not mind, you can just sit. The way I spoke confidently but calmly, yes, because the tension she was building, if we go with that, we may miscalculate the rules. I would, for me, I do not like doing lumbar puncture with the parent by the side because it's traumatic. Don't do it. Oh, yourself, you become more scared. So, but if, but if it's a procedure, you are very, very comfortable with No problem. Yes, but I don't think it's something that is wrong. Secondly, sir. So, so, sorry. So, patients, they will tell you, doctor, what you want to do for me, go ahead and do, but don't tell me anything. The reason being that if you tell them, they will not do that surgery. They will be so scared, they will be afraid. So they will say, Doctor, I don't want you to tell me anything. Anything you want to do, just do. Why should I sign? That concept of informed, because even me, if I'm flying and they say, in the event that this flight will land in, I feel like coming out and uh, walking out. <laughs> okay, Doctor, yes. I think uh, it also depends is um, context specific too. Because abroad before they allow them to go and see or be by the best idea, usually they will walk them through the antenatal care, they know what they are going to see. I had a situation where I was the house officer then, and the man insisted on coming in. He became a patient to be fainted. That was in the labor room. And uh, there was also a surgery that was done uh, the hospital had a, a room for observation, like glass, so the relatives could see, and some of them collapsed. So there has to be, uh, if you're going to have uh, them come in to watch, yes, the patient must also give their consent, and then they must be properly educated. And anyone, even at the dying minutes, that feels not okay, should be taken out. But be prepared, if you have not walked them through properly, on what to expect. You may have someone call us. Very true. Okay, so in that case, I think the, the, the rule for consent is for the benefit of the patient. And consent can be waived. Yeah, he has a right. Yeah. Sure. The patient should be uh, able to tell you, I want social pressure to come in. But also, as he's giving that consent, it should be written because when the table talks, the, the writing is not is, or you record it. It's not it's not negotiable. Just like he said, he says, Oh, just give me what it is to write, I will write. But the purpose of your procedures, um, the law is the law is basically that once a full grown man who knows how to read signs a document. The presumption is that everything he signs, he intends it. And so even if he tells you that meeting you are talking about, please waive it or tell him, no problem. I'm going to waive it, but there are documents to sign. Yes. So you give him the document and he signs, and you can go ahead with your procedure. Okay. The second okay. if, if in terms of the context, you find out that uh, in some hospitals, you have a common word. You don't even have curtains in between. It's a bit difficult to tell a man who's his wife, who his wife has said, I want my husband to be with me, because other people's wives are there. Yes. And then looking at our societal beliefs and practices, to bring in a man to be watching other people's wives, uh, yeah. bring, may even become a good person. Yeah, that's true. That culture around it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we'll just have to bring this um, training to a close. It's been engaging. 
I want to believe that we the, the feedback forms have all been filled. I want to use this opportunity on behalf of Limi Hospital and Brainimate Consulting to thank the participants. Um, you've been engaging. I have learned a lot. I want to say thank you for attending the training. I also say thank you to the um, online participants. Uh, there's someone who is raising hands. Okay, sorry. From the someone is raising Usman Justina. Uh, okay, a Jehovah Witness. Let me take this that question. Thank you. A Jehovah Witness who had an ANC in our facility did not disclose her faith until when she presented in labor. We asked for power of attorney and the relatives brought empty power of attorney form. We needed to take decisions for CS. Please, who signs the form and witness? And when is it, um, when is it the ideal time to fill the form? It is the outline, sorry, is the online still on? Can they hear me? I want to believe, Pamela. They can hear. Okay, so um, so it's it's important that the consent form and whatever the documentations are, they are signed. If the woman, if she said um, she presented in labor, so labor, she can sign. Her husband can sign. If the husband, if the person that presents himself as the husband signs. I want to believe that that is fine if she can't sign. But to have an empty power of attorney, I really don't understand what the power of attorney form is in this context. I'm completely lost. When I when I think power of attorney, I think delegation, right? I think delegation. So it I don't understand a power of attorney form in this context. What you should have, we have said throughout this um, medical legal um, session is you should have a consent form. And the consent form is as prescribed in the rules of medical um, ethics. Yeah, it, it, the rules of medical ethics is detailed. All you need to do is copy it. Don't even amend it. Yes. Yes. And then they bring the form saying this person has signed and take this. Well, that's their own decision. Yes. yes. Okay. So I think that's what you know. refer to. And then they bring that. Okay. Something you need to get from the content form. Yes. This other person says. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. I understand that now. Okay, so I believe that question is answered. Um the, and the ideal time to fill the form is before whatever the procedure is that you are carrying on. And it's always nice to put dates and time. And so as lawyers, we train people, we train um, our litigation officers because um, usually since we argue a lot and contest even obvious things. So if you bring a letter to my law firm, for example, um, the person checks precisely what, what nature of the document is, and then he puts his name, his rank, his title, and then the date and the time. I don't have time to give you cases in which time became material as far as certain um, controversial issues was concerned. So for those kind of um, procedures, the time, sometimes the time the document was signed is um, is material, and if you sense any problem, you can even actually ask for just an identity check. You know, send for serious issues. Send your let's be sure that what you signed is correct. Is your is you are the person signing what you claim to be. As a consultant, uh, PN, I'm not too sure what PN is now. Call a patient presented and eventually 
the medical officers on call operated, but you were not told, you were not told, and something went wrong. You were summoned in a court of law. How do you defend that? For that simple, you're a consultant and you are not aware that the people, if I understand this question, you're a consultant, maybe urology. And uh, in the department, a patient comes and uh, the team didn't tell you about the patient. You didn't know about it, provided you were not absent from duty. You are not, well, I don't know about that, but if you can prove, if you can prove this assertion that you are completely unaware. Um, Dr. Lowe, let me give you Dr. Lowe's scenario to answer your question. Dr. Lowe is a captain, a naval captain, and a, another gynecologist, obstetrician and gynecologist. Uh, this woman presented problematic, she was pregnant, all the high point signs, a papa naval medical center. She got in there at about six. So the nurses checked her, did all the things. She had done her antenatal care there and she was a high risk kind of a patient. He came in, he just asked the nurses questions and went to play tennis or something. Um, this was about 6 p.m. He didn't come back. The woman developed complications. He didn't come back until 6 a.m. in the morning. So at the time he came in, the woman had bled and had become so complicated, he referred her to Yaba Military Hospital, where she died shortly after. He was actually practically, his, his own case was a court martial since he's a military officer. Uh, but the medical legal issues were very clear that he did not attend to his patient. If he had attended to her, Within that 12 hour period, leaving his subordinates when the high risk issues presented themselves and he knew, I mean, he was completely negligent. Right to the Supreme Court, he was, he was, he was found guilty. The tribunal found him guilty. Court of Appeal found him guilty. The Supreme Court found him guilty. He, knew, he saw the woman, he knew before he went to, yes, they called him and told him that, look, the complications had gotten more complicated. Sorry. Yes. So, so, so you can. So I think that if you call have some call, it's actually his duty to be aware of patients are coming down in this call, uh, saying that the people I put there to stand there on my behalf, they not communicate to me and try to push it to them, is not going to be very tenable. And also that sometimes, I mean, there are many methods of reaching a bit. I know in many other clients, they use pagers and things like that, secure networks. If I go somewhere now, if I'm on call, I go somewhere that my phone is not reachable, I can't say that, you understand? Because there are some decisions they can't take. If I say they operated the patient and the patient died, I say it's their fault. If I say they left, they left the patient, they did operate and the patient died, it's their fault. I'm not on call. So I should make sure that I check in with the team from time to time and make sure that I have adequate oversight of what's going on. So I think that is, if the person is indeed on call, that's, that should be his responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Milan's case was similar. You know, the Metama um, case. He was, he was the, the, the he, the two junior doctors, the one the registrar also, were there. They carried out the surgery. But when things went wrong, the yeah, he was the one that was responsible. Of course, the three of them were were um, brought before the tribunal, but he was not left. Um, was not left. A lower punishment, yeah. He was, he was given six months, he was suspended for six months also. So I must round up with these certificates. You know, doctors, by virtue of um, your calling and, and profession, sometimes you issue out 
documents that have serious implications. Um, things like sick leave, death certificates, um, medical reports, um, what else? Name them. Yes. You know, fitness to fly. Um, and, and, and it not name it. Yes. Now, it's, it's so easy to sign those things without understanding the full implications of what you are signing. I mean, we don't have time. One of the cases I thought we'll go into, but our next um, ones will be the doctor that issued another death certificate in Lagos, the man died, in, um, died somewhere in the East of Akaliki, I think. And for whatever reason, the relatives wanted another death certificate for whatever purpose he took to claim here, you know. So the doctor, knowing that a death certificate had earlier been issued where the man died, issued another certificate. He lost the case right from the tribunal, convicted him, the court of appeal convicted him. As a matter of fact, it is a crime. It's a crime because it's, it's like forgery, it's like deliberately misrepresenting the state of things. And death, things like death, um, you have issues like inheritance, estate issues, you know, you have things like estate issues, the man, the man has a plethora of properties, he has two or three wives, and there is a lot of contending issues. And when it comes to administration of estates, probate matters, wills, and things like that, the time of death can be a serious legal issue. The cause of death can be a serious legal issue. And so when a doctor is signing some of those documents that look medical, he needs to sign them with the legal aspect of just a pure sense of responsibility, candor, and forthrightness in mind. And um, the reason is because you may be called, and it may be ten years after, to come and give a witness, to come and give evidence in respect of it. So imagine you signed a, a, a medical uh, a death certificate that um, someone died in your in your hospital in Lagos, and a court case ensues, and evidence comes to you so clear that he could not have died in Lagos <laughs> because he died in Odisha or in, in uh, somewhere else. Now, this is like 10 years after. So it's important that I just highlight the importance of the documents that you sign by virtue of your profession as a medical practitioner. Ensure that they are simple, there's no complications about it, but just make sure that you can defend whatever it is that you sign in your capacity as a medical practitioner because it has seen it can assume a serious medical legal dimension. I am grateful. Sorry, you put in your hand. Oh. Okay, that's the last question, I'm sure, or talk so we can. Just to join my voice before you just said, I had a personal experience okay. uh, nine years ago. Okay. I actually issued a death certificate to road accident victim okay, so. who died during active resuscitation. Yeah. In 2011. I told to come back to me in 20 in 2009. I did that in 2009. He came back to me when I was in another hospital on transfer in 2013, about four years after. Actually, what happened was the man had a case with the EFCC. The man that died had a case with the EFCC. So when they summoned the hospital where I issued that test certificate, they wrote to them that it was false. The EFCC came after me in the other hospital where I had been transferred to. So I had to go and do an 
was that sacked myself. Since they have been stealing stigma from the you know to do that it was paid. I had to go and run up and sack myself. So it was a nurse's record in the emergency and the test certificate, which usually comes in court room, that I took to EFCC. So just to you know further add to your voice, yeah. we need to keep proper records. As you know, I didn't put that up sack myself. I was having a trouble. That's true. I had to search for it myself in the mortuary of the other hospital. Whereas the hospital has actually issued a signal that they don't know anything about the cancer four years after. So it was the protocol of my commission that I took there and the nurse's record for that shift that saved my head. Very true. Thank you so much for adding that um, very practical experience to the issue of documentation and signing of legal documents in your capacity as a um, medical doctor. So once again, we want to thank you for attending this medical legal um, training. If you have filled the form um, and you have your um, name on the register, we assure you that um, the team will send you the slide. I have a slide, half of it you didn't see here. Um, I'll send, we'll send it to your emails and uh, I'm sure that the things that we've practically learned will be um, an equipping tool in our hands to help the good people of Nigeria. Once again, on behalf of Nimi Hospital and Greenly Med Consulting, God bless you and God take you home safely. Once again, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I just want to use the opportunity to appreciate uh, Brilliant Consulting for facilitating this. I think it's been excellent. I want to believe that it's been valued for all our time. And I want to believe and trust God that we're going to use everything we learned here today to improve our practice, improve the healthcare landscape in Nigeria, and hopefully uh, minimize litigation. Once again, this was brought by Demi Osuto and Brilliant Consults. Uh, Limia Hospital has member hospitals, including Cardio Care Multi Specialty Hospital, uh, where I lead, Limi Children's Hospital, where Dr. Peter Igoche is at, and of course, the Limi Hospital Health Headquarters and Diagnostic Sec uh, Center, which is a central area of, of, of CBD. Um, I'm aware that Willamette Consulting and Limi Hospital is also happy to host uh, in hospital training for our staff because. It's important that leaders of the hospital know this, but it's also important that we make sure that our staff are medical legally aware so that all of us stay abreast of medical litigation. So once again, thank you so much for coming and thank you for making this a worthwhile time for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Same as it is available at the back. Yes, so I, I don't know if you call out the name. Yes, um, okay, so as we are passing at the back, as we are passing okay. on our way out, I think we'll just pick them up one, one at a time. All right. Um, who is taking a closing prayer? Right. Okay, so I think I'll just take a closing prayer briefly. Uh, let's stand up for the prayer, please. In Jesus' name, in the mighty name of Jesus, kind of thing, kind of for everything we've learned in this meeting today. We trust that uh, this will impart in us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding so that we can improve our practice and we can improve the teamwork of our facilities. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Okay, I've just been informed that. Uh, is an arrangement for group photograph outside. Group photograph outside after you picked your CME and your certificate. Thank you.